Welcome to the Cuphead DLC extravaganza. In this case study, I'll first provide a bit of background information on Cuphead and the development behind the DLC. Next, I'll break down the most prevalent new DLC items and upgrades and how they relate to the game's original design intent as well as Studio MDHR's creative vision. Lastly, relegated to its own separate video, by far the largest and most comprehensive section that you don't want to miss, I'll be discussing each individual boss and its design in great detail. What did the DLC execute well? Where did a stumble and fall? And what improvements or solutions can we make to any problems? Find out on this episode of Design Frame, a case study of Cuphead the Delicious Last Course. In 2017, Cuphead hit the world by storm with its hand-drawn rubber hose animation style from the 1920s and 30s. Cuphead Studio MDHR painstakingly created Cuphead with the same techniques of the era. Traditional hand-drawn cell animation, watercolor backgrounds, and original jazz recordings that I unabashedly own the full set of in a beautiful sleeve. Cuphead garnered its widespread attention primarily from its presentation, and for good reason. Cuphead's visuals are unique and well animated, harkening back to 1930s cartoons. We grew up watching old cartoons. When it came to finding what kind of game and what kind of style we wanted to do, we grasped on our favorites. We couldn't unsee it after we saw it. It was just, this is going to be really hard to pull off, but we had to do it. When we first landed on this art style, something just didn't look right until we finally said, okay, you know what? If we want it to look like the 1930s, we have to do it the 1930s way. Originally, Studio MDHR planned for a small scope and a maximum of eight bosses as a short one and done passion project. This is even earlier than Cuphead. Jared and I were first talking about making this super tiny game, maybe only five to eight bosses. We were just like, let's start a company and try to work on a game and work on a concept to something. And if we know it's, it, it seems like something we would want to do, we were determined to fulfill like that passion, that dream to be yeah. like, before we're dead, we're making a game that <laughs> yeah. we like, irregardless of any size, like we would have finished a smaller game, shipped it out, if nobody heard about it, then I would have went back to pouring concrete and been like, I'm really glad we did that. Yeah. yeah. After the astounding attention they received from Cuphead's trailers and cartoon visuals, Studio MDHR greatly expanded Cuphead to their dream scope. Fast forward to E3 2015, and the reaction to that was just like floored us. That floored us so much that we started talking about what if we went back to our dream scope that we had and and started doing this and but what's it going to take? Yeah. Like, should we, you know, we can start yeah, looking yeah. at remortgaging the homes and quitting our jobs. Our initial plan was no overworld, just yeah, yeah, yeah. a really select down. screen, right. where you, almost like a fighting game where you just choose the battles. And, and famously, the, the, the run and gun sections came in later. Yes, that was in our original dream scope of let's make a boss heavy game and we'll kind of pepper these like run and gun levels in. Born from their childhood passions and eventually the Xbox 360 era of indie titles, Studio MDHR began work on their dream. We always wanted to make a game just as that fantasy. Yeah. And then the real spark came after the initial indie game explosion. So Castle Crashers, Super Meat Boy, Braid. So the 360 era. Yes, and that we saw like these small teams working on these really cool games. Yeah. And you know, that sparked the conversation, what if we could do something like this? And to think that I could make something that could have an impact on this kid even creatively, and to thinking, hey, I know two guys made this. Like maybe I can make something too. <laughs> It's just cool. Uh, it's, it's really cool. It feels really, really good. And wow, Cuphead contains 19 beautifully drawn and animated boss fights, some with multiple entities, plus nine mini bosses within King Dice's bout. Studio MDHR should rightfully celebrate the release of their fully realized dream game with the entire scope intact and more to absolute critical acclaim. 
What makes Cuphead's success even more astounding is the fact that its development process is practically unsustainable. Every frame was traditionally hand-drawn on an animation cell, then inked, scanned, colored, and finalized. It took Studio MDHR an average of 25 minutes to produce a single frame, and they animated the game at 24 frames a second. With close to 45,000 total frames of animation, the time investment for the animation alone amounts to 18,738 hours, almost 8 years and 3 months of standard 40-hour work weeks. Given how arduous and risky Cuphead's development was using Studio MDHR, HR's traditional techniques, techniques that any studio would be hard pressed to use well, it's a wonder they pulled it off. However, despite Cuphead's success, Studio MDHR were beginners in the video game space, and it shows. While Cuphead was a realization of passion and an awesome dream, it suffers from general game design issues. Cuphead's game design is overall poorly structured and understandably amateurish. Its gameplay, however, is at least fair in its difficulty, and it does have its well-designed moments, often leaning heavily on its surrealist themes and slick presentation. But this is where the game often breaks down. For a boss battler, engaging in consistent themes that shape the game mechanics are crucial. This is evident when Cuphead really shines. Cuphead is at its best when it leverages its surrealist inspirations from classic cartoons in order to establish a consistent core theme around which each boss is built. Yet, what makes Cuphead great is also often its downfall. A significant number of Cuphead's bosses don't use surrealism, they abuse it. The illogical nature of surrealism, wherein anything can happen as long as it's an expression of self, often derails the central theme of a boss. Instead of leaning on the theme and drawing the mechanics out of that theme, bosses frequently just seem random. This randomness manifests in several ways, the worst in a boss battling video game being that bosses often use a hodgepodge of random attacks which are only loosely strung together. The variety of surrealism, which comes about by spewing the contents of your subconsciousness into video game form, along with the interplay between simplicity and complexity, which is meant to create tension and resolution, but also to instill a feeling of unnerving anticipation of what could possibly happen next. Both of those together often just seem misplaced, like the art was separate from the game mechanics. They don't often go that extra step to take the crazy inspired art and turn it into a cohesive of design. But when they do take that extra step, like with the well-structured Captain Briny Beard, Sally stage play, and Cala Maria, the game homes in on greater engagement, rather than shallow, misplaced randomness. The important thing is that the pieces are there, though. Despite its failings, Cuphead can easily be a learning platform for future Studio MDHR projects or other multi-phase boss battlers, and this case study aims to highlight how those learning opportunities can benefit future studios and games. Fast forward to the DLC. Cuphead The Delicious Last Course was in development for roughly four years. First revealed at E3 2018 with a 2019 release window, multiple delays pushed the release all the way to 2022. The DLC adds one new aisle to the game with five new bosses, five mini bosses, and one secret boss. The base game was a massive amount of work, but it doesn't hold a candle to the DLC. Studio MDHR not only doubled, they tripled down on everything. Despite being roughly one-third the size of the base game, the Delicious Last Course took the same amount of time to develop and has roughly the same number of hand-drawn animation frames, which is in itself a huge feat and a further enigma of game development. In an article by Rebecca Valentine, According to Maya Maldenhauer, the sheer volume of animations in Delicious Last Course stemmed from the team's desire to bring to life everything they had left on the cutting room floor of the original Cuphead, with the playable Miss Chalice serving as a catalyst for the rest. We really wanted to experiment with the art form. I don't have an inventory yet or a frame count, but it is comparable to the entire core game in this one DLC. Moldenhauer quips later that the members of Studio MDHR are the kings and queens of Scope Creep, which is one of the reasons Delicious Last Course is such an animation monstrosity. 
In a Screen Rant interview led by Devin McClure, according to Chad Moldenhauer, It got to the point where we had to actually really dig into ways of compression or saving the files, because we were getting to the limits of what we could actually do with the current generation. And then on the non-technical side, I think it's just doing stuff leaning towards the Fantasia era, with shading on top of an already complicated and long animation. A shading pass that goes on top of that, and there might be another highlight pass. It seems like it's just coloring, but it's actually animating all of the shading and highlights on top of these things. So, there's a lot of complex stuff that we threw at this game. Maya Moldenhauer explains in a video from Nintendo Everything. We're really known for boss transformations. This time around you're going to see a lot of boss transformations, but as well as location transformations. So between phases, you will land in a totally different arena, which means almost triple or quadruple the background art and watercolor paintings done by Caitlin Russell. Incredible, incredible work. Um, the music in itself is double the orchestra from the original game, so we had 65 people in the original soundtrack and now we're over 110 for this one island. We almost liken it to taking it from the early 1930s of iWorks and Fletcher Studios cartoons to closer to where we were striving of Fantasia. At the same time, trying to find a balance with making it congruent with the original game and not going too far off. In a Game Informer interview, Maya comments on what she's most proud of from the development cycle of the DLC. We stayed true mm -hmm. to quality over things like uh, timeline, budget, things like that. Also just our people. It was not easy on any developer. Mm -hmm. Um, whatsoever. They're just, they're just amazing group of developers and animators and we're like a very close-knit family. The delicious last course was a true labor of love. They could have created more of the same to critical acclaim, but instead they went above and beyond. They experimented even further with the art form and strived to break personal barriers, and it certainly shows. The DLC is an incredible, impressive display of animation quality and passion. However, despite spending more resources on less content, the result isn't necessarily an improvement over the base game. While Studio MDHR stayed true to their inspirations and wowed us with even more impressive animations in the huge labor that was the delicious last course, they not only failed to fix the old design problems, but introduced new ones as well. However, that's not to say the DLC doesn't bring anything good and fresh to the table. Some of the DLC's new mechanics are fantastic and left me wanting more, such as Gnome Way Out's third phase's deep and intuitive gameplay loop, Doggone Dogfight's lasers, screen rotation, and Canteen Hughes's aeroplane underneath our feet, and Snowcall Scuffle's second phase's excellent use of variety and attack overlap for its pacing. The narrative cohesion is often out of this world, between High Noon Hoopla's hilarious transitions from cow to sausages to packaged meat, and Bootlegger Boogie's prohibition mobster theme that's surprisingly ingrained in the boss and a unique experience for Cuphead. The DLC's insane new surprises explored some of the extreme potentials that Cuphead could offer, whether falling into a giant's mouth, a colossal metal airship Chinook flipping the screen around, or the most famous of them all, Bootlegger Boogie's mob boss himself pulling and a fast one. Not to mention the absolutely unforgettable animation monstrosity that is Chef Saltbaker and how his animations add so much personality to not only himself, but his attacks as well. And then to top all of this, there's a noticeable increase in quality and detail throughout. But then there are the DLC shortcomings. One of the biggest of these is power creep and imbalance through the addition of new DLC equipment and Miss Chalice. Each problematic addition compromises Studio MDHR's design intent and vision in several ways. Astral Cookie, through Miss Chalice's insanely versatile moveset and attributes, is a massive buff incomparable to anything else in the game. To Studio MDHR's credit, Miss Chalice is cleverly designed. Astro Cookie would be an engaging addition if Miss Chalice was specifically designed and balanced around the DLC and then relegated to the DLC exclusively. But she's not. Her power level is simply incompatible with the base game and devalues every other charm by comparison. To make matters worse, Astral Cookie, paired with Miss Chalice's super, Shield Pal, wildly outperforms any other equipment options. It absolutely takes the cake. 
But then Heartring comes along and takes whatever's left of the cake when Miss Chalice is done with it. It's the second place charm. Somehow, even being much worse than Astral Cookie paired with Shield Pal is still outpaces every other charm in the game. Heartring's downsides are insufficient, and the charm undercuts any sense of accomplishment the player might gain from achieving high ranks, significantly reducing the importance and satisfaction of mastery. Between Astro Cookie, Shield Pal, and Heart Rain, the DLC handles health, the most valuable resource, recklessly. Overall, the DLC additions are sloppy. They imbalance the game and invalidate previous options. Instead of providing more options for players, the DLC equipment pursues an upgrade mentality, lower in the skill floor, with the effect of making the whole game easier, as opposed to raising the skill ceiling, which gives players the opportunity to improve to new heights. By making previous options obsolete, the upgrade mentality essentially takes away player choice rather than providing new opportunities for improvement and growth. Throughout this case study, we'll examine both the highlights and shortcomings in detail. To that end, I'll also provide several possible solutions for design issues and potential improvements for both the new DLC equipment and bosses alike. In the next video, the continuation of the case study, you'll find my extensive deep dive into the bosses, their mechanics, and their design. I'll give the bosses plenty of time to shine, but first things first, the DLC's imbalance and betrayal of Cuphead's design intent and vision. Studio MDHR began with a vision. Cuphead would be focused entirely on bosses and the inherent satisfaction of overcoming challenges. From the beginning, we were like, we want this to be a game that we would really like to look yes. at, we would really like yeah. to play and more of an homage to the older era too, which means the difficulty has to be somewhat challenging. And once we were determined on that, we'd watch people play, see where capabilities lie, if something's maybe a little too hard. So lots of the festivals and seeing fans play definitely helped. We have like a core group of gamers between us. So I could invite over a group of people I used to play Street Fighter with or some people that I'd always see at the arcade, yeah. or a few friends that are like, do like some speed running or something. I mean, I think Cuphead is challenging, but it's still an accessible game. The controls are not particularly difficult. You can pick it up and get right into it. What they were trying to do was recapture the feeling of the games that they played when they were growing up. Games like Contra and Gunstar Heroes, boss battle kind of side-scrolling games. Even if it was challenging, there was often a feeling of when you finally got it, you learned something and it was rewarding. So I think that is what keeps people coming back to this. You can spend, as you said earlier, six hours on one boss maybe, but every time you do it, you get a little bit closer, you learn a, a new trick. That's what we love about the best games, isn't it? Is the fact that we realize that quite often we're the problem, not the game. The game's not being unfair. <laughs> You're just meant to jump and avoid that particular projectile. You then learn as you go. And I do, I do feel like the progression of Cuphead, you constantly have this feeling of progression of, oh, just one more bit, if I can just get to that next time. Don't be intimidated. We have all skill levels within the company itself. And it's just as fun for you know, a novice player to a seasoned one, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and I think with Miss Chalice's new abilities, it's gonna be, com it's complimentary to Cup and a Mugman, but at, at its core, it's our love letter to 1980s retro arcade games, and they're not fun if they're not challenging. Every gamer gets some sense of satisfaction of overcoming something. Yes. So there's a whole broad spectrum of gamers, and to to get that feeling for like a per or people like us or our friends group, it needs, it needs to match sort of the way we had it. Well, and we kept some of our really good gamer friends in the dark on purpose. Because we could work on the game and do everything, and then we could have them come in fresh. Yeah. And we knew they were amazing gamers, so just seeing them take a pass at the game and going, oh, that one thing is like for... Mm. Because they didn't know it was there, and we've been playing long enough and think, oh, this part's really easy. That one thing is nearly impossible for like a, you know, yeah. super well, but gamer. Believe this, at some point, the genie was like, two times as hard, <laughs> 2.5 times as hard. Studio MDHR intended Cuphead to be a difficult game for its established target audience, and for good reason. Cuphead must be sufficiently challenging because the game's one and only objective is completing the challenge. 
our objective is to beat bosses. There are no secondary objectives, nor is there any meaningful meta progression. If Cuphead cannot consistently deliver challenge, then the game has failed its vision because we have no objective. It would cease to be a game at that point, instead becoming nothing more than a nostalgic museum of hand-drawn animations. To achieve Studio MDHR's creative vision of succinct, satisfying challenges, Cuphead needs a minimum level of difficulty, a skill floor, defined as the minimum level of skill needed for game progression. If, at any point, that skill floor were to diminish, or in other words, if the difficulty became lesser or trivial, there is no longer an objective to the game. Difficulty is a tricky topic because different players have different skill levels based on their experience and physical abilities. One level of difficulty might prove trivial for one person and very difficult for another, and Studio MDHR's decision not to include difficulty settings can be a possible critique. However, that decision is in keeping with their original design intent. We have like a core group of gamers between us, so I could invite over a group of people I used to play Street Fighter with, or some people that I'd always see at the arcade, yeah. or a few friends that are like, do like some speed running or something. And then also test with people who never play games. And part of it was like trying to adjust something down to a person who's never played a game yeah. was to me no longer fun and since the the core design was already done by a certain point it wouldn't have been too practical to try to reverse it at that point right. to yeah. match the audience that like may or may not do it yeah. yeah by accommodating players outside their established vision and difficulty meaning providing difficulty levels or character upgrades that you often see in other games cuphead would open a wide hole in its design when players are struggling, Cuphead's goal is to encourage practice, improvement, and mastery against a fair and balanced challenge. And only through practice and improvement can players accomplish a satisfying and uncheapened objective. The satisfaction a player gains by overcoming a challenge defines Cuphead's entire and only foundation. Therefore, it is the designer's job to balance the game's challenge against assumed player skill. If the goal is to use player skill to overcome challenge, then the challenge should not be diminished. That would imbalance the game. The designer should not give the player an easy way out. There should be no opportunity to cheat the challenge. This could only serve to ruin the player's experience. Whenever players have an option to pursue an easier difficulty or utilize an upgrade that's more powerful than the others, designers must assume players will take advantage of it. Players seek the path of least resistance, especially in a game where players have to struggle to improve. For many games, seeking the path of least resistance is the game. Finding a way to upgrade a character or create synergy or manipulate numbers in a way that makes your character stronger than their opponent is integral to many games. Cuphead is not one of those games. It is not about character ability, it is about player skill. To reinforce the game's balance between a difficult but achievable challenge and players' incrementally increasing skill, Studio MDHR did not offer a traditional easier difficulty, but rather simple mode. Simple mode reduces the number of phases, attacks, and other modifiable properties that overall reduce difficulty. However, completing bosses in simple mode does not allow you to fully complete the game. Simple mode does not unlock the final two bosses of the base game nor the new DLC final boss. Simple mode's purpose is to allow players to practice and improve in increments from simple to regular mode. While simple mode should have allowed players to practice every phase of a boss, in keeping with the principles of mastery, it's otherwise a great system for players who want to ease into the challenge without compromising the game's creative vision, a fair and balanced satisfaction in overcoming challenges. To really drive home the goal of mastery, meaning incrementally improving player skill until the challenge is no longer challenging, Studio MDHR implemented a ranking system. Your rank is determined by certain criteria, a time limit, how much health you have left, how many parries you executed, and how many super meter cards you depleted. The first time we face a boss, we practice that boss until we simply beat it. After we beat it, we continue to practice until we master it. 
In this way, the ranking system was designed to encourage practice and improvement, extending beyond just beating a boss. This is evident in how the ranks are broken up. The first time a player faces a boss, they'll do so in either simple or regular mode. In simple mode, the max rank a player can achieve is a B+. In regular mode, it's an A+. Yet you cannot achieve the maximum possible rank of S unless you're playing on expert mode. This suggests that, because people cannot play expert mode on their first playthrough, that replaying the same boss, and therefore incremental improvement, is a core element of the game. If Cuphead's minimum skill floor encourages the baseline necessary challenge for its target audience, then both the ranking system and expert mode really drive home the goal of player satisfaction and overcoming challenges through mastery. Both systems, the regular and expert difficulty modes and ranks, root themselves in practice and improvement but create a natural progression toward mastery that doesn't sacrifice Cuphead's creative vision or potential satisfaction in the game's target audience. After years of service, this betrayal, I don't understand it. Studio MDHR designed Cuphead with the intent of difficult challenges. In keeping with that intent, we should expect the DLC to maintain that standard of difficulty, even if the base game does occasionally struggle to create well-structured and meaningful challenges. This means that the DLC needs to enforce the established skill floor. Studio MDHR even explicitly designed the DLC with the base game in mind. Jared Maldenhauer, co-founder and lead game designer of Studio MDHR, explains how he intended the DLC bosses to be around the same difficulty as the base game's IL-3. There was a benefit in the first game to being able to show it on show floors. So we had more playtesters, essentially. 20,000, 40,000 people play the game. They could kind of gauge where the average skill set is kind of at. It's like finding the challenge and then the reaction time and then really pushing yourself to earn that moment of finally getting victory. So that's sort of the theme of what we wanted to do for the entirety of Cuphead. Whereas DLC, we were kind of in the dark. COVID kind of doesn't let you test sure. with large groups of people. So it was more just going internally being like, does this seem like it's about as hard as that Island 3 range? And then just roughly play through with the people in the company. But the problem is everybody's 10 times better because they already know exactly what to expect. And then the last of the long part of the ramble is there's just like a series of internal rules where I'm like, I got to be able to beat every boss in under two minutes with just P-Shot. So I put that test to myself and then I'm like, okay, I got to be able to beat every boss in under a minute. I set challenges to myself until I can complete them and then I'm like, this matches the rest of the game reasonably. It's, it's more like your skill versus these bosses. Right. So when we approached DLC, we knew that this would be the fan base returning for the game that they loved. So it didn't need the introductory bosses. Right. So that whole slime veggies kind of like let you get into the swing of things would have been a waste of of what we could do with a boss. As far as the difficulty goes, we just did our best to balance it to around that World 3 level of difficulty. Oh yeah. Like there's still a learning curve, but it's not technically harder than the original game. Yeah. Except for maybe the final boss on New Game Plus might be the hardest yeah. that's been out there. Studio MDHR, on more than one occasion, expressed their vision of matching the base game's difficulty with the DLC. But whether they intended to match the base game's difficulty or even increase the challenge to a higher level, the fact remains that in order to maintain their vision, the DLC cannot lower the skill floor already present in the base game. Spoiler alert, the DLC lowers the skill floor already present in the base game. For those unfamiliar with Cuphead, players collect coins during run and gun levels throughout the game. They can exchange these coins for equipment at a shop. The shop cycles through equipment in a specific order, but displays multiple at once. Equipment can be changed out between battles on the equip card. There are two types of equipment, charms, and weapons that can be purchased from the store, and a third type, the super equipment that can be acquired by completing mausoleums. Early on in the base game, the equipment that players can buy is fairly well balanced. It doesn't increase the character's power level, instead providing more options to players, encouraging them to experiment with different weapons and see which one was most useful against which boss. In short, equipment does not move the skill floor early on. 
Once the player unlocks the weapon's roundabout and the much more offensive charge, that changes. These weapons nullify previous weapons to an almost indefinite degree. Once these are unlocked, there is almost no reason to go back to any previous weapon for one reason. They lower the skill floor. They are better and more useful in almost every situation and increase not just damage potential, which would indicate an increase in skill ceiling, but average damage, which indicates lowering of the skill floor. As the player progresses, the equipment system devolves into a shallow progression system that no longer encourages experimentation. It's worth noting that increasing a character's power level is not inherently a bad thing. There are some games where increasing your character's power level is the game. Again though, that's not this game, or at least it shouldn't have been. A game where mastery and improvement is the sole objective should not cheapen the completion of that objective. That's what the base game's equipment does. That's the base game. Now let's examine the DLC equipment under the same lens. Following Studio MDHR's tripling down on the DLC, if the base game equipment compromised the game's core design that improving player skill is the game, the DLC equipment further invalidates the game's core design and mastery principles, even introducing blatant power creep in the process. What's worse, the new additions not only affect the DLC bosses, but retroactively trivialize the old ones as well. The power level disparity between the base game and the DLC equipment is vast, giving the player more damage, more health, and more maneuverability, thereby completely destroying the balance between character power and boss power. If a player uses these more powerful, incompatible DLC equipment options to complete a base game boss, the player may unwittingly compromise the challenge. It is likely a player will do so because 1. DLC equipment is in no way distinguished from base game equipment in the store, and 2. The equipment is available very early, aisle 2 for Heart Rain and as early as aisle 1 for Astro Cookie. And in the case that a player does know what they are doing and they use DLC equipment in the base game, the power differential between items allows the player to bypass player improvement, therefore bypassing the point of the game, improvement and mastery. As a result of all this, base game S-ranking becomes trivial. This is unacceptable in a mastery-based game. If equipment is supposed to provide options, as opposed to simply raising your character's power level, then each equipment option should be relatively equal in power. One charm or weapon might be situationally better than another, but the power level should be roughly equal. This is simply not the case for some of the base game and now DLC equipment options. Even if we ignore the base game bosses and assume that a player is only playing the DLC with these new items, the additions still don't conform to the original design vision. An upgrade, by its nature, makes the content that came before that upgrade easier, which is inconsistent with the concept of mastery. And that's exactly what some of the equipment is. Pure upgrades over previous equipment that make that previous equipment obsolete. As in the base game, there are a few worse defenders in the bunch, namely Miss Chalice, Heart Rain, and Crackshot, which we'll talk about now in detail. The Legendary Chalice is an NPC in the base game who we rescue from the Mausoleum Parry challenges. She becomes a playable character and one of our primary equipment options in the DLC after we acquire the Astro Cookie when we first head to the Isle. When we equip the Astro Cookie into our charm slot, Cuphead swaps places with Miss Chalice, and off we go on her quest to steal ingredients from the locals in order to bake a Wonder Tart, as ridiculous and illegal as that sounds, which will permanently free her from the Astro Plane. Miss Chalice's moveset is overall cleverly designed. It's satisfying to dodge and weave through enemy attacks using her superior maneuverability and double jump, all the while setting yourself up for your own attacks and parries, parries which, in turn, give you even more maneuverability. It's fun, it increases the skill ceiling, but it's not balanced. Miss Chalice is not a balanced character. Even though she takes up the charm slot, replacing some of the best equipment options in the game, she has a lower skill floor. The result of that lower skill floor is that beating any one boss with Miss Chalice is easier than beating that same boss with Cuphead. Instead of lowering the skill floor, it would have provided a more satisfying experience if the DLC maintained the same, or higher, skill floor but increased the skill ceiling. 
For the game Cuphead, a skill ceiling is the amount of player skill required to completely master a boss, character, or weapon. Players can continue to invest and improve in their skill until they reach mastery or the maximum potential. The most prominent example is Cuphead's ranking system. A Cuphead boss awards an S rank for, ideally, a difficult but reasonable expectation which represents a player's mastery of that particular boss and of the currently available tools relevant to the challenge. Games that raise the skill ceiling create new opportunities for improvement and growth. They expand potential mastery not by making a character charm or weapon strictly better, but by adding onto past player skill with new skill. Some examples of this, generally, might be that a player needs to time a specific ability in order for that ability to have its greatest effect, or that a certain combination of abilities or skills done in a certain order or in combination with some other element of gameplay, such as maneuvering your character, creates synergy between them. This adding on of skill creates layers of mastery, and layers of mastery, in a mastery-based game, are what makes new content fun to engage with. The character Cuphead is shallow because his skill ceiling is relatively close to his skill floor. He doesn't have things the player can time for greater effect or combo together. He is flat, so there's little satisfaction in mastering Cuphead himself. The mastery lies in the bosses themselves, specifically in achieving high ranks against each of the bosses. Miss Chalice, on the other hand, is a much more ideal situation where her skill ceiling is noticeably higher than her skill floor. Between her double jump, her dash parry, her dodge roll, and her dash and jump resetting on successful parries, there's room for comboing and synergy. Even once we learn how to use Miss Chalice to the degree that the game deems acceptable, her skill floor, we still have considerable room to practice and improve to reach her maximum potential, her skill ceiling. While Miss Chalice would have been a great addition to the game because she represents the ideal pairing of easy to learn, difficult to master, she's also unfortunately a perfect example of a character that's strictly better across the board. Her skill floor is lower than Cuphead's, and because she's not restricted to the DLC, and the DLC isn't strictly balanced around Miss Chalice, she compromises the base game. To make matters worse, she's also available from Isle 1. Overall, Miss Chalice is all around better than any of Cuphead's charm options due to her improved maneuverability and control, as well as her increased health and her more potent supers. Miss Chalice has an insane amount of extra maneuverability for two reasons. One, she has a double jump, and two, her dash parries. Miss Chalice's double jump gives her significantly more control over her jump. Instead of one single full jump like Cuphead, Hers is two shorter hops. Like Cuphead, her jumps still vary in height depending on how long you hold the jump button, so it maintains that intuitive and responsive control necessary for precise platforming and movement. However, unlike Cuphead, she has more control and accuracy over where and when she lands due to her second jump. Her shorter jumps let us hit the ground faster in order to regain full ground control. For bosses that shoot many projectiles in quick succession, this can be invaluable. In every case though, it's better than having a single jump. One might make the argument that having to jump twice raises the skill floor. It might be more difficult for some people to time two jumps as opposed to just one, but this argument ignores the fact that people who are unable to time jumps effectively will perform even worse with one single jump. One single jump is much more punishing if you mistime it or move in the wrong direction. A double jump allows you to correct mistakes, something that the base game doesn't really let you do. Speaking of correcting mistakes, mistiming a parry as Cuphead feels awful. Not only do you miss the parry, but you likely put yourself in harm's way to do it, and if you mistime a parry, there's no way to correct it. However, with Miss Chalice, whose dash now parries, you get not only a huge forgiving parry window, but often a quicker and more accurate parry as well. She can even dash into walls to halt her movement, safely parrying anything behind her. Her parry is overall astronomically easier to use and more versatile compared to Cuphead's parry. It's not even close. In addition to all of this, after a successful parry, she not only gains height, but instantly gains another jump and dash. Her dash also resets after about a second in the air. So what does this do to our skill floor? Well, it makes it go down. 
In the base game, Parian had a trade-off. It was potentially dangerous to attempt. With Miss Chalice, that's not true anymore. Parian is relatively safe, and in addition to being safe, it gives us a huge boost in maneuverability by resetting the dash and the second jump. It's having your cake and eating it too. As stupid as that saying is, that's really what it comes down to. Miss Chalice has the best of both worlds. She gets more maneuverability, more options, and more control with no trade-offs or downsides. Cuphead has to commit to every single action. His single jump is less forgiving and less versatile. He can't jump after dashing, so his dash lands where it lands, period. His parry has a very tight hitbox and window, and it doesn't activate until partway through his jump. All this combines to make his jump less effective and his parries sometimes unforgiving or finicky. None of these circumstances affect Miss Chalice. Astro Cookie lets the player fix mistakes and diminish risk for free, and it does so without requiring anything in return. It doesn't reduce offensive capability or affect movement or exact any price whatsoever for the huge benefits it provides. Equipping a charm that powerful needs to have a cost. At the very least, committing to actions with Cuphead should give the player some benefit over Miss Chalice's non-committal playstyle. This could be represented through a risk-reward structure. The greater risk with Cuphead, having to commit to actions, should mean greater reward. Conversely, lesser risk, like you have with Astro Cookie, should provide less reward. The standard risk-reward structure is a common mechanic in boss battlers that rewards the player for foresight, planning, and game knowledge. To a limited extent, this risk-reward balance exists in the base game, but is seen in only a couple equipment options. The spread weapon has a high risk due to its wide-angled multi-projectile pattern. The player must position super close to the boss and at the right angle so all four bullet streams can hit the boss, providing a highly rewarding damage output greater than the average damage pea shooter. However, Cuphead mostly abandons the risk-reward design in favor of overall better, low-risk, high-reward, straight upgrade weapons, and the DLC continues that misguided, low-risk, high-reward trend in almost every aspect. A big, committed attack, like Spread, has a greater payoff than smaller, less risky ones, like Pea Shooter. This is one way that games increase their skill ceilings without lowering their skill floors. Mistiming these big commitments might kill you in a lot of games, so knowing when to attack, when to jump, when to use items, etc. is important and part of the game's learning curve. For a game like Cuphead where mastery is the goal, various commitments and possibly mistiming or mishandling those commitments could have been further implemented to great effect beyond just the spread weapon. Astro Cookie cannot support its extremely high reward without a corresponding high risk to bring it back down to earth. Really, the only maneuverability downside to using Miss Chalice over Cuphead is that the player could be using Smoke Bomb instead of Astro Cookie. Cuphead's Smoke Bomb charm takes the same place as Astro Cookie, which is how you use Miss Chalice. Smoke Bomb gives Cuphead an invulnerability dash, which can be used in the air, while Miss Chalice's invulnerable dodge roll can only be used on the ground. This very small trade-off is easily made up by Miss Chalice's maneuverability, so it's barely a trade-off at all, unlike Smoke Bomb, which has a real downside. During Smoke Bomb's invulnerable dash, Cuphead is momentarily invisible, which may cause the player to lose track of where he is, which is something that can't happen with Miss Chalice's dodge roll. When using Smoke Bomb, the player must have a pretty strong feel for the dash length, especially when fighting bosses requiring extensive platforming, and especially because Cuphead doesn't have any post-dash recovery options like Miss Chalice. If equipment is supposed to provide options as opposed to simply raising your character's power level, then Smoke Bomb and Astro Cookie should be relatively equal in power. One charm might be situationally better than another, but the power level should be roughly equal. This is simply not the case. I'm using Smoke Bomb as an example because it is by far the most versatile and therefore useful charm in the base game, but it's not the only charm that's cut down by Astro Cookie. Miss Chalice's dash parry completely supersedes the Pea Sugar charm due to the ease of parrying. Her dash parry also, to a lesser extent, outmodes the coffee charm as well, since coffee provides passive super meter gain, gain which becomes a smaller percentage of total super meter gain throughout the match if the player effectively parries more often. 
just Miss Chalice's maneuverability by itself beats Whetstone. Whetstone is one of the most interesting charms due to its high skill ceiling, which maximizes damage output the more times a player parries. Unfortunately, it also doesn't come close to Astral Cooking. The player's ability to stay on target with their weapon is the single largest determinant of damage output. Miss Chalice's maneuverability allows her to do this, making any extra damage the player may have earned from Weststone's parries insignificant by comparison. Even beyond Miss Chalice's much improved maneuverability, her extra one health nullifies the heart and arguably twin heart charms, as we'll discuss later. Every benefit from Astro Cookie is straight up better than other charm options, and it's not even close. What would have made these equipment options comparable are trade-offs. For example, if equipping Astro Cookie gives the player superior maneuverability, there needs to be a downside, a trade-off of some kind. The trade-off might be that each jump has even less height or can't be fine-tuned by holding down the jump button for the desired amount of time. It might be that Miss Chalice doesn't have an invulnerable dodge roll at all, making Cuphead Smoke Bomb Charm still comparable. Perhaps Miss Chalice only gains half a super meter card from parrying instead of a full card, making pea sugar and coffee still viable options. Since the base game charms already exist in the game, we cannot retroactively buff the base game charms to meet new content. That would be the wrong way of fixing power creep, which has no place and somehow exists in a game with only a few player options. Instead, we must lower Astral Cookie down to the level of the base game charms, so that every charm is still a viable option. We'll talk more about this in the solution section. Somehow, maneuverability isn't Astral Cookie's only insanely overpowered effect. Cuphead has three health. That means you can only be hit three times by any damage source before you lose and have to restart the boss. If you're attempting to S-rank a boss, you've already failed if you take one singular damage. This can be very, very punishing, but necessary to enforce the purpose of mastery and Cuphead's gameplay loop. If Miss Chalice's maneuverability wasn't enough on its own, Astro Cookie gives us another huge benefit, an extra health. And the strange thing about this is that the item's description doesn't even tell us about it. So, we're going to pause talking about imbalance and failed design intent and shift to another topic that I've covered in a separate video, transparency. I'll link the video at the end. Transparency is an exceptionally important concept. The transparency of a game's mechanics or systems is key in game design and, if mishandled, can ruin or significantly alter a game's experience. To give a short definition, transparency is the degree to which the designers make game mechanics and systems, which are stats, abilities, objectives, etc., obvious and clear to the player. The primary ways most games do this is through tutorials and tooltips, or descriptions, usually text, or, in the better, juicier cases, hands-on demonstrations. There are sometimes reasons why a designer would withhold information from a player, or in other words, intentionally limit transparency. For example, you might be playing a survival game. A big part of that game might be learning the game mechanics, learning how to survive through experimentation instead of having designers telling you exactly what to do. Figuring out what to do is, after all, the whole game. Another reason designers might withhold information from the player is to create a narratively significant or satisfying wow moment. The hero of the story automatically equips a new magic sword, and the player doesn't know that magic sword shoots laser beams until they swing it for the first time. How cool is that? But the important part is that if the player is making decisions, they should have all information available to them before they make that decision unless withholding information serves a purpose. In the case of Astro Cookie providing a hidden benefit, I would suggest a third reason why the designers did not reveal all information. They, I guess, forgot? Because Miss Chalice has a tutorial, the extra health is the only major feature that isn't taught. The act of discovering this extra health through experience provides no value. Player experimentation serves no purpose here. But alright, it's not a big deal. Changing the item's description to accurately convey its effect would have been an extremely simple fix, but not knowing about that extra health probably doesn't change anyone's game experience. A player is likely to try out Astro Cookie because they get it for free. They don't really need to make a decision like they do when determining which item they want to buy next from the store. Unfortunately, Astro Cookie is the least offensive poorly written description and it continues an unsavory trend from the base game. 
There are several incomplete or misleading charm descriptions from the base game, namely Pea Sugar, Weststone, Heart, and Twin Heart, and continuing the trend onto the DLC, Astral Cookie, and Heart Ring. Starting with the base game, the charms Pea Sugar and Weststone have incredibly vague descriptions which force the player to make assumptions about how they work because they lack context. For Pea Sugar, the first parry move could be interpreted in two different ways. It could be interpreted in the intended way, that every time a player jumps after touching the ground, the first parry of that jump is automatic and that the ability resets when you land again. Or, it could be interpreted that only the first parry of the entire fight activates this ability. Strictly looking at the description itself, there is no indication which option is the correct one. Because players have a limited amount of money to buy equipment early in the game, they have to make a decision to buy this item over other items. Without complete information, players cannot objectively make that decision based on how they want to play the game. This is a failure of transparency. When it comes to learning charm functions, there is no value in player experimentation. Weststone copies the text from Pea Sugar almost exactly. Weststone's Your First Parry could be interpreted in the same two ways as Pea Sugar. Again, failure of transparency. Heart and Twin Heart are also two base game charms that share poorly written text. In exchange for weakening our attack power by an unspecified amount, these charms give us extra health. Heart gives one extra health, Twin Heart gives two. Potentially, unbeknownst to the player, these items are great for an initial playthrough. Without checking the wiki, a player has no idea that lightly weakens means reduce by 5%. 5% is practically nothing. For every 20 times you hit a boss with the charm equipped, it is as if you hit that boss 19 times without the charm, and in exchange you get a 33% increase in health. That's a significant return. In the case of Twin Heart, weakens means a reduction of 10%. In exchange for a 10% reduction, meaning for every 10 times you hit a boss with the charm equipped, it's as if you hit it 9 times without, you get a 67% increase in health. For a 67% increase in health, players are likely to assume that they will be given up more than a measly 10% of their damage. This is a failure of transparency. Again, when it comes to learning charm functions, there is no value in player experimentation. Without knowing to what extent their attack power is reduced, many players will forego these charms in favor of a charm like Smoke Bomb, which is clear in its description. Why would a player ever risk buying the charms Pea Sugar or Weststone, which initially appeared to provide worthless once per fight effects? Why would a player ever risk buying the charms Heart or Twin Heart without really knowing what they do? Heart and Twin Heart are, to those who don't look at the wiki or conduct extensive testing, undiscovered overpowered charms because they offer health, the most valuable resource, with minimal trade-offs. But how would a player know that? How would a player know that when other powerful charms exist with clear descriptions, namely Smoke Bomb? Without complete clear descriptions, players have no reason to deviate from the tried and true smoke bomb. They will not experiment with new potential strategies or playstyles. Because of this lack of transparency, most of the base game charms fall flat. And no matter how effective the charms may be, they might as well not be in the game because the descriptions give the player no reason to buy them. For those who don't play a game by reading the wiki, for all intents and purposes, the only charm in the base game is smoke bomb. Moving on to the DLC, Heart Ring is an incredibly powerful charm that gives the player health on successful parries. Unfortunately, its description is also unclear in its language and omits important information. I'm detecting a trend. Heart Ring is missing an entire part of its description. Normally, when a player successfully parries, their super meter increases. Filling and subsequently expending the super meter is a requirement for ranking, and once the super meter is filled, a player can use their super ability. The description on Heart Rain fails to inform the player that Heart Rain suspends super meter gain from parries until they have parried six times, at which point super meter gain from parries resumes as normal. There is no reason why the description should not say this. This is a failure of transparency. Again, when it comes to learning charm functions, there is no value in player experimentation. The lack of transparency prevents players from making informed decisions in a game that controls your money intake. So if the player makes a poor decision, they're stuck with it for a while. 
There's no other way to put it. This is bad. It completely removes player agency from the equation. Astral Cookie is the least offensive of the bunch, but it clearly follows a dangerous trend. Okay, transparency over. Back to Miss Chalice and her stupid 4 health. Having 4 health instead of 3 is a massive buff, and she gets this in addition to her increased maneuverability and her invulnerable dodge roll. The charms that allow Cuphead to run with more health, Heart and Twin Heart, and the DLC charm, Heart Rain, all have trade-offs or drawbacks, as minimal as they might be. And even if those charms had no trade-offs, they'd still all collectively be a single drop in the bucket compared to Miss Chalice paired with Shield Pal. The most important trade-off, however, is that when using these health charms, players cannot use the Smoke Bomb charm to compensate for Cuphead's maneuverability downsides. Miss Chalice, on the other hand, has a partial Smoke Bomb, no maneuverability downsides, and an extra health with no trade-offs. Miss Chalice's extra health is by and large way too much. It lowers the skill floor and encourages an upgrade mentality instead of an options mentality when selecting equipment. Miss Chalice becomes a jack of all trades, but doesn't really have the downside of not being great in any one area. Miss Chalice's extra health poses an even worse balancing issue when we consider her new super arts. There are eight total super arts in the full game, four for Cuphead and four for Miss Chalice. One of the four options for both Cuphead and Miss Chalice are unique supers for aeroplane levels, leaving only three options for each of them in normal battles. No matter which super the player chooses, they gain super meter cards in a battle by dealing damage and parrying pink objects or attacks. Once the player acquires five super meter cards, they can spin those cards to activate their super. Most supers give the player a small invulnerability window either before, during, or after they deal a damaging effect, and they all have pretty hefty animations, suggesting they're very powerful. Cuphead's Invincibility and Miss Chalice's Shield Pal are the exceptions. Invincibility makes Cuphead invulnerable to damage for 4.85 seconds. Shield Pal provides Miss Chalice with one health in exchange for a full super meter. Neither of them have a damaging effect. These supers are not designed to deal damage, or at least not directly. Instead, they focus on longevity, staying alive longer in order to deal more damage, and in Invincibility's case, more consistent damage. But while Invincibility requires timing and boss knowledge, Shield Pal is simply a flat power upgrade that requires no additional input from the players. Because Miss Chalice starts with 4 health and can consistently gain at least 2 additional health with little effort from Shield Pal by filling the super meter with damage and easy parries, the super nearly guarantees at least double the standard 3 health. Just on its own, gaining extra health might not seem like a bad thing, especially if the bosses are balanced around that fact, but the problem becomes apparent when you compare Shield Pal to other super arts. The other supers, both for Cuphead and Miss Chalice, simply cannot compare to Shield Pal. What the comparison between super arts comes down to is the question, can the damage from a super compare to the damage potential of gaining an extra health? The answer is unequivocally no, not unless supers deal significantly more damage than they currently do. The reason being, one health, even in the suboptimal case of using that extra health to take damage and continue shooting through the invulnerability window, still provides more passive utility than any of the damaging supers because health is the most valuable resource. To break it down into its smallest parts, health provides three benefits. The first and most obvious is that health keeps the player from losing the fight. The more health the player has, the less likely they are to fail at any given skill level. Secondly, each health has a damage potential commensurate with the player's ability to deal damage and not get hit. For some players, this might not be an exceptionally high potential because those players are more likely to get hit than others, ergo they are able to deal less damage with that health. As a whole though, the damage potential will at least equal the amount of damage someone can deal while invulnerable after getting hit, but in all likelihood should be significantly higher than that. And this is the third benefit of health. Health comes with a built-in invulnerability window, which means, for an experienced player, damage received equates to an increase in consistent damage dealt. A player that has just taken damage can stand still during the short invulnerability window and not worry about other sources of damage. The closest of Cuphead supers that's comparable to Shield Pal is his invincibility. Invincibility can be a powerful super because we can activate it at the right time to dodge an attack, then deal consistent damage without interruption. 
Invincibility can be extremely useful, but it requires proper timing to take full advantage of. It's also satisfying to use because it rewards smart play and good timing, whereas Shield Pal does not. Shield Pal is mindless and provides the most important and powerful resource at the push of a button. Shield Pal's extra health can also be sacrificed to briefly deal more damage. While that brief damage isn't as impactful as Invincibility's damage, Shield Pal's extra health is still, on average, more valuable than the damage that Invincibility can provide. To further devalue Invincibility in comparison, if we're using a weapon like Charge, Roundabout, Chaser, or Crack Shot that can still hit targets while we're dodging, then Invincibility's ability to deal consistent damage no longer benefits us since that function is fulfilled by our weapon choice. If the player is using any of those weapons, Invincibility's only use becomes avoiding an immediate enemy attack. Or we could just use Shield Pal since it doesn't care about proper timing. The only argument that could be used in support of the other supers is that they have a higher damage output, or in other words, damage over time, or how quickly a player can deal damage. But as we'll discuss, this is misleading. Overall, Shield Pal is absolutely broken, especially paired with Miss Chalice's 4 health and dash parries. Shield Pal allows Miss Chalice to play recklessly and still win, which only further diminishes the game's experience, challenge, and mastery potential. That's Astro Cookie and Miss Chalice. For those of you disinclined to use Astro Cookie because she's too mechanically different from Cuphead to break from your comfortable familiarity, we'll head on over to Cuphead's Neck of the Woods and take a gander at the DLC charm, Heart Rain. Heart Rain is arguably the most powerful charm aside from Astro Cookie. With a single parry, trivial in any boss fight, Cuphead now has four health instead of three. The Heart Charm is now useless. With two more parries for a total of three, he has five health. That's Twin Heart gone as well. With three more parries for a total of six, he now has an insanely high six total health. It's likely the player will beat the boss before they get to that point for the aforementioned reason that health is so potent. So to balance all this extra health, one might assume Heart Ring comes with some sort of trade-off like Heart and Twin Heart's damage reduction, some con to balance out the pros. Well, one would be right. Heart Rain does come with what were intended to be downsides. However, these trade-offs are ultimately inconsequential. What are they then? Firstly, Heart Rain gates the three bonus health behind a parrion requirement. Unlike the other health charms, Heart, Twin Heart, and Astro Cookie, which all provide their extra health immediately. In the case of Heart and Twin Heart, they have their own trade-off of reduced damage output. Unlike Heart and Twin Heart, Heart Ring does not directly affect damage output, but instead unlocks each bonus health after completing 1, 3, and 6 parries, respectively. Heart Ring's extra requirement for health gain should theoretically act as a reward for an additional challenge or skill expression. In other words, the item gives the player an extra task outside of their normal objectives, and once they complete that task, they get something to help them complete the primary objective. It would be sort of like an optional objective. But this extra parrying requirement for gaining health, the optional objective, does not justify the whopping 3 bonus health for two reasons. The game's ultimate goal is to achieve high ranks, and in order to do that, the player has to fulfill a number of requirements. One of those, a parrying requirement. The parrying requirement for ranking happens to be the same requirement for Heart Ring's extra health. It's already a core mechanic that's essential for A plus or S ranks. It's redundant. It's not an optional objective. It's the primary objective. It's something the player was doing already. There is no additional challenge or skill needed to complete the Heart Ring requirements. By the time the player achieves the three parries required for the max rank, they've already received two of the three extra health from Heart Ring. The last three parries to achieve the third extra health is, more likely than not, a short stretch from the two extra health. Even without parrying as a ranking requirement, parrying in Cuphead is one of the main tools players utilize to improve their skill and ultimately defeat a boss. Therefore, as players improve, they'll likely parry more often because parries provide super meter gain and assist players in destroying pink hostile objects. And the more a player parries, the more health the player gains from Heart Ring. 
the player is already improving at the main objective of the game, which is to overcome a boss's challenge. So if the player chooses to engage with the parrying system for its assistance in achieving that challenge, then Heart Ring compounds that reward without additional challenge or player input. Players who engage with the parrying system and improve over time have to improve less than they would without Heart Ring due to the extra health. It actually impedes skill gain. Heart Ring is a significant payoff for no additional challenge or skill. Its parrying requirement simply isn't a sufficient trade-off to justify the three bonus health. Surprisingly, Heart Ring's delayed extra health isn't its only, or even primary, trade-off. As we talked about during the transparency section, Heart Ring's primary trade-off isn't even on the charm's description. While Heart Rain is equipped, Super Meter card gain is suspended until the player completes all six parries. Suspended Super Meter gain effectively reduces the total number of cards gained in a fight. If you were to compare a battle with Heart Rain equipped to a battle without Heart Rain equipped, assuming the player performs the same number of parries each time, this reduction amounts to six cards, which is a full meter. While this sounds like a sufficient trade-off on paper, in actuality it has no effect. First of all, a player gains super meter cards passively by dealing damage. Since damage in the boss is the objective, you can be sure a player will be doing that. This passive super meter gain, just by itself, grants enough super meter cards to satisfy A plus or S rank requirements. Therefore, the suspension of super meter gain does not affect ranking requirements at all. Heart Rain's decreased gain in Super Meter cards should theoretically affect Cuphead's damage output since he can't perform as many supers and EX moves, so it would be a clear downside for Heart Rain. But in practice, the decreased Super Meter gain does not affect damage output. A note, damage output here means damage over time, or how quickly a player can deal damage. To illustrate Heart Rain's negligible effect on damage output, I performed an experiment in which I fought multiple bosses several times and compared the time it took to complete each of them on average. First with no charms as the control, then with the heart charm, then twin heart, and lastly with Heart Rain. I used Chaser for consistent damage, hit the same number of parries each attempt, and used supers when available. On average against all tested bosses, Heart saw a 5-6% increased duration and Twin Heart saw a 7-13% increase. As anticipated, these results reflect the equipment's 5% and 10% damage reduction, respectively. Heart Rain, on the other hand, saw an average duration increase of 0%, neither an increase nor decrease in duration. Why does Heart Rain's decreased gain in Super Meter not affect damage output? In order for damage output to decrease as a result of less super meter gain, super meter gain would have to equate to more damage. In other words, performance supers and EX moves would have to deal more damage than attacking normally. Additional supers should result in more damage. Conversely, and in the case of Heart Rain, fewer supers should result in less damage. In reality, this is surprisingly not the case. The next step in my experiment was to test the efficacy of damaging supers and EX moves, including both Cuphead and Miss Chalice's two damaging supers each. To do this, I first fought multiple bosses with no charms, executing as many supers and parries as possible, and spending any leftover super meter cards on EX moves. After that, I did the same thing again, but without using any supers, EX moves, or parries. If supers and EX moves increase damage output, the results would show a decrease in a fight's duration using as many super EX moves and parries as possible. This was not the case. There was no significant change in fight duration. Here's some of my test data for Beppy, Grim Matchstick, and Rupak. Each attempt was within a few seconds of each other, more often slightly faster with supers, surprisingly sometimes slower with supers, mostly within the margin of error of my varied performance as a fallible human, suggesting that supers and EX moves either have no or minimal damage contributions in a typical boss fight. So what does this mean for the game, and what does this mean for Heart Rain? My results lead me to believe that, first of all, supers exist solely for their invulnerability window, which can sometimes be more harmful than helpful considering many of them arrest your character's movement. Additionally, supers existing only as invulnerability windows is inconsistent with how big and flashy the damage animations are, a failure in visual and systems design. Secondly, supers and EX moves seem to exist as an arbitrary and somewhat redundant offshoot of the S rank parry requirement. They exist only to reinforce the concept of ranking as opposed to actually adding anything meaningful on top of it. 
I sometimes beat bosses faster without supers and EX moves. And honestly, that's hilarious because a mean studio MDHR did not consider, number one, that players cannot shoot while performing supers and EX moves, and two, how that would affect overall damage output. And then they went and used the concept in Heart Ring, seemingly without understanding the implications at all. The main trade-off of Heart Ring has virtually no effect. Less super meter gain from parrying does not noticeably decrease damage output or increase fight duration or even make it harder to satisfy super meter or parry requirements. So why does it exist? The potential trade-off does absolutely nothing to justify Heart Ring's replacement of the now irrelevant base game charms. In a strange turn of events, whether this was intended by design or not, the DLC weapon Crackshot synergizes with Heart Ring. Crackshot's EX move, P-Turret, can be parried to deal damage to the boss. For whatever reason, that parry counts toward a Heart Ring, reinforcing the upgrade mentality that only the best equipment can be used because the best equipment is even better when paired with other best equipment. EX moves only cost one super meter card, so with P turret and heart ring, you can guarantee six health for every grounded boss without parrying a single enemy attack. Heart ring destroys the distinction between beating a boss without an S rank and mastering a boss with an S rank. With or without heart ring, if a player takes zero hits, they receive an S rank. This true mastery was the original ranking design intent. With Heart Ring, you can take one, two, or three hits and still receive an S rank. To put that into perspective, if you take three hits without any charms, you fail the fight, period. It does not mean you get a low rank, it means you fail the fight and have to start over. With Heart Ring equipped, you can lose two to three health on average, the same health lost that would otherwise outright fail the fight and still have the three health you need to receive the highest honor, true mastery, full S rank. And on top of that, you don't lose 10% of your attack damage across the board from equipping Twin Heart, which has the effect of increasing boss length and potentially making the player miss the ranking time requirement. Overall, Heart Rain undercuts the accomplishment of achieving high ranks, significantly reducing the importance and satisfaction of mastery. There's one last charm I've been ignoring up until now. Despite its incredible power and the fact that it is the strongest addition in the DLC, I haven't mentioned it yet because, unlike Heart Rain or Astral Cookie, it does not interfere with the game. Divine Relic is a completionist item, and it's hidden as a post-game secret charm. Unlike Heart Rain and Astral Cookie, it's intended for players who beat or reach the very end of the game. Divine Relic is a combination of several charms in one. Smoke Bomb, Wet Stone, Heart Rain, and an improved coffee. It's sort of in the same vein as Astral Cookie, which gives the player a ton of benefits all mashed together. In order to obtain Divine Relic, the player must first solve a puzzle in Aisle 4 with the Broken Relic, then become cursed by the Cursed Relic from the DLC's secret boss, then defeat a bunch of bosses with one health, virtually no charms, and weapons that randomize every time we start shooting, which is interrupted by dashing and EX moves. It's basically another mastery option. In order to acquire it, the player has to have already mastered the game. And while the one health isn't as brutal as it sounds, since there's a lesser heart ring built into the cursed relic, I was even able to receive a perfect score on a couple bosses because of that extra health, it's still a tough challenge that I enjoyed immensely. Divine Relic is explicitly designed to be an overpowered reward for several secret post-game challenges. It visually and auditorily indicates this extreme power by applying cyan after images to Cuphead and by changing the overworld music. It is not a normal equipment item, and it's not meant to be perceived as such. Both Divine Relic's visuals and the method by which it is obtained are extremely important in shaping how the charm is perceived by the player, yet when it is acquired is the most important fact. The player will likely not pursue Divine Relic until the post-game, and this is what sets it apart from the similarly overpowered Heart Rain. Divine Relic is acquired at the end of the game as a secret reward. Heart Rain is available from the normal shop. Divine Relic stands on its own, while Heart Rain is misleadingly presented alongside other charms in the shop as if they're on equal footing. Divine Relic and Heart Rain both break the game's challenge, but only Heart Rain can do so unbeknownst to the player. 
Divine Relic is overpowered done right, Heart Rain is just overpowered. Heart Rain was a poor addition to the game, and its implications should have been further considered. When Studio MDHR designed Ms. Chalice's moveset, which you activate with Astral Cookie, they definitely threw off the balance of the game. Instead of balancing down, meaning making DLC equipment, including Astro Cookie, less powerful and more in line with other options in the game, they decided to balance DLC equipment to Astro Cookie's level, making the DLC equipment better than any of the base game options. Heart Rain is just a blatant power spike in order to have a viable alternative to Astro Cookie. Heart Rain seems to be a response to Astro Cookie instead of a unique and interesting item in its own right. Instead of creating an equipment option like a key with a specific purpose, they created a hammer that clumsily smashes its way to more health, then stumbles into a perfect rank with minimal effort. It betrays design intent. Whether it was intended as a response to Astro Cookie or as a pure upgrade better than the rest capstone charm, Heart Rain confuses me. It just doesn't seem to have a place in the design vision, and as such, was a harmful addition to the game. Just like Astral Cookie, with an incredibly powerful effect and no noticeable trade-offs, Heart Rain lowers Cuphead's skill floor instead of raising the skill ceiling, taking away player choice rather than creating new opportunities for improvement and growth. And yet, Heart Rain and Miss Chalice weren't the only unbalanced DLC additions. The last equipment item we'll talk about is the DLC weapon, Crackshot. Crackshot suffers from the same problems again. It's a jack-of-all-trades, pure upgrade over other options. At short to medium range, Crackshot deals the same amount of damage as other non-homing weapons. At medium to long range, Crackshot becomes a homing projectile like Chaser and deals similar damage per second. So not only can Crackshot deal the same damage as weapons that either require aiming or might miss while the player is dodging or moving, but it can also deal consistent partial damage and automatically destroy destroy projectiles, thus increasing survivability. It's similar to Chaser, except if Chaser had normal damage potential baked in and dealt with destructible threats significantly faster, increasing its damage potential even further. Dealing partial damage when Crackshot misses is just plain silly. There is no risk reward as there is with aiming weapons and no real skill required. It is a straight upgrade over most other weapons, viable in all situations, and with a weakness that's almost never relevant. What weakness do we speak of? Crackshot's homing shot can miss fast moving distant targets. However, that's a rare occurrence. I played through every boss with Crackshot to test Crackshot's weakness, and it only ever became noticeable against Goopy's first phase, Mortimer's first phase, Howling Aces' second phase, and Moonshine Mob's third phase. But even then, it either did not impact the fight or was easy to account for by pointing the weapon in the general vicinity of the target. Crankshot's supposed weakness wasn't even a factor in Sally Stage Play's fourth phase or Glumstone's third phase, even though it seemed like it should be, further showcasing how easy it is to accidentally avoid its weakness. Crankshot also despawns once it's far enough off screen, which awkwardly breaks player expectation. There's no reason for shots to despawn when they should still be relevant and active, and there's already the precedent of Roundabout not despawning off screen until they're no longer relevant or active. At the very least, Crackshot contradicts the game's two weapon system. Cuphead's base game weapons aren't balanced either, but they're at least somewhat designed to excel in one area and be lacking in another. So the player needs to select two options that offer different benefits and pair well against the boss they're facing. Crankshot is instead the best of all worlds, especially because it's greater than the sum of its parts and is yet another unbalanced DLC addition. Between Miss Chalice, Shield Pal, Heart Rain, and Crankshot, a game with only two characters and a handful of equipment options unironically introduced power creep. 
Power creep is the gradual unbalancing of a game, leaving new content to overpower and replace the old. Power creep is an unfortunate expectation in games with a lot of expandable content. Trading card games like Magic the Gathering, fighting games like Smash Bros Ultimate and Unmatched, and MOBAs like Heroes of the Storm. But power creep in a 2D shoot 'em up boss battler is absolute insanity. We're talking two characters versus over 50,000 cards and 89, 50 plus, and 90 characters, respectively. In a game with only a handful of equipment options, Studio MDHR continued their misguided upgrade mentality from the base game forward. In the base game, Studio MDHR started by creating a few weapons that properly served their own purposes and provided players with interesting options. Then, Roundabout, but especially Charge, emerged as the clear overpowered winners, invalidating previous options. The charms mostly devolved into risky investments with vague and incorrect descriptions that weren't worth engaging. And the cherry on top, standard super and EX moves don't contribute much to the game and might as well not exist. With the introduction of the DLC, every problem is compounded. While charge is still the highest damage output weapon and relatively easy to pull off because it is blatantly mishandled and overpowered, at least it still requires some amount of effort to use and has one weakness, dealing with large crowds of minions or destructible projectiles, so it pairs well with another weapon like spread or chaser. Crankshot somehow takes weapon and balancing to a whole other level. It's mindless, consistent, and the best of all worlds, automatically dealing with anything destructible and homing in on targets. While Twin Heart was a hidden gem in the base game due to its poorly written description, Heart Ring by and large takes the cake. It doubles your health almost for free without a single trade-off, compromising the game's intended challenge and mastery and ranking systems, the only reasons to engage with the game. Astral Cookie, when paired with Shield Pal, is somehow even more pernicious. Miss Chalice starts with 4 health instead of Cuphead's 3 and can gain beyond Heart Ring's max of 6. When we also consider Miss Chalice's flexible and versatile maneuverability and risk-free trivial parrying, Astral Cookie with Shield Pal goes above and beyond to leave all other charms in the dirt, even including Heart Ring. To give anecdotal evidence, as Cuphead, I struggled to get to Chef Salt Baker's second phase and never to his third. I then switched to Miss Chalice with Crackshot and Shield Pal equipped, and I beat him in only a few attempts with a perfect A ranking. I had 7 health, extra maneuverability, and Crackshot's benefits. Afterward, I defeated Chef Salt Baker on Expert with an A minus ranking. It's absolutely tough as nails and took me 25 minutes to beat, but I made it through with 9 health. Then I unequipped all of the DLC items and attempted Chef Salt Baker again on Expert with Cuphead and Twin Heart, and sometimes Smoke Bomb. After an hour, I never made it past the second phase, and I gave up. I equipped the DLC Charm Heart Ring and eventually beat the boss with one health left out of six, so Heart Ring clearly carried me. Don't get me wrong, mastering Miss Chalice's movement feels amazing, and her moveset is overall cleverly designed. However, she's extremely unbalanced and overpowered, and I should never have 9, 7, or even 6 health. There's too much of a discrepancy between the base game and DLC's items and characters. Ultimately, the DLC cheapens the experience. Cuphead's base game and DLC fail to provide meaningful, reasonably balanced options and instead are incompatible not only with each other, but with the ranking system. Mastery is no longer an important part of the challenge in a mastery-based game. Acting as the full realization of the insidious upgrade mentality which the base game introduced through its abusable weapons, the DLC does everything in its power to emphasize character ability rather than player skill, and in doing so diminishes the game's carefully considered challenge. If the goal is to leverage player skill to overcome challenges, then the challenge should not be diminished. Cuphead cannot provide opportunities to cheat the challenge. In a sufficiently challenging game, players will almost always seek the path of least resistance, and if the goal is to create a satisfying accomplishment, that path cannot be one that circumvents the challenge. It should be a path that engages with the game's one and only goal, to practice, improve, and master challenges. Studio MDHR's stated design intent was to create a satisfying challenge, 
Cheapening that vision through power creep and upgrade mentality cheapens the game. It becomes a novelty museum of cool looking animations and classic cartoon visuals and nothing more. So what could have been different? Let's move into the practical application of these theories. First, how do we fix heart ring? The simplest and most effective option is to remove it from the game, but that's removing content from a paid DLC and not very exciting. Two better solutions would be to either 1. Implement a trade-off that makes using the charm less of a straight upgrade, or 2. Turn it into a real challenge to achieve the extra health. Both solutions which Heart Rain already attempted but failed. Heart Rain's undisclosed trade-off either has no or unnoticeable impact on the boss fight, and as we've discussed, the current parrying requirement or sub-challenge to achieve the 6 health is practically a non-factor. Before any changes are suggested, we should first identify our constraints. As you might guess after watching the theory section in this video, our first and primary constraint is parity with existing charms. In other words, the revised heart ring needs to achieve a power level equal to other charms. To realize this parity, heart ring should be limited to two potential health to bring it in line with twin heart. Bringing Heart Ring down to Twin Hearts level also conveniently eliminates the need to have both a sub-challenge and a trade-off. Only one or the other is required. By reducing the potency of the health effect, we require less significant balancing factors. But, since health is the most valuable resource and any item that provides health is therefore extremely powerful, we must still implement a sub-challenge or a trade-off in Heart Rain. And since Twin Heart also provides two health but at the cost of a trade-off, naturally a sub-challenge is the more interesting place to start. As stated, our goal is to make the power level of the two options roughly equal. If Twin Heart is a guaranteed 2 extra health with a damage penalty, and Heart Ring is a possible 2 extra health at full damage but with a sub-challenge, the two equipment options become comparable. Twin Heart has no risk but reduces damage dealt, while Heart Ring does have risk, the risk that a player might miss the extra health or even take damage in the process, but does not have a trade-off. The sub-challenge required to gain the extra health acts as a risk-reward mechanic. It rewards players for exceptional skill and acts as an interactive increase to the skill ceiling, not to mention the added benefit that a sub-challenge is generally more interesting from a gameplay perspective than a flat increase in character power, as with the existing Twin Heart and Heart Ring. So, bring Heart Ring down to two potential health gained via a sub-challenge and then focus on making that sub-challenge interesting. Our next constraint has to do with the design vision. Because Cuphead is meant to be a challenging game that focuses on mastery and improvement, the sub-challenge required to gain that two extra health needs to be sufficiently difficult to warrant such a high reward, but not so difficult that Twin Heart is always the better choice. Remember, health is the most valuable resource because it equates to potential damage, a higher win chance, and with the current HP bonus system for ranking, a higher rank. So, the sub-challenge can't be easy, and it can't be guaranteed. That brings us to our last constraint, limited player verbs. Player verbs are the actual things that players do. They are actions that translate into gameplay. In a trading card game, player verbs are deck building and playing cards. In a first person shooter, player verbs would be shooting, moving, and maybe throwing grenades. Player verbs dictate our possible sub-challenges because they are the actions a player may take while playing a game. We can't have a sub-challenge that isn't supported by current player actions, and we're going to assume that we cannot add new game mechanics that would add player verbs. In Cuphead, there are only a few player verbs, and they can be broken into two categories. What the player does before a fight, and what the player does during a fight. What the player does before a fight is limited to spending money in the shop and choosing equipment, the gameplay loop here being finding the most efficient combinations of equipment to defeat the current target boss. What the player does during the fight, and this is our constraint, is limited to shooting, using EX moves and supers, parrying, and maneuvering within a confined space, which includes moving and jumping. Cuphead isn't set up to support deep, complicated sub-challenges because there are only so many player verbs, and they're simple ones at that. Furthermore, whatever sub-challenge we come up with has to be consistently applicable across every boss. Now that we have our constraints, let's think about possible sub-challenges. The first sub-challenge that came to mind was a system whereby a player must damage specific areas of a boss when they appear. Upon dealing enough damage, health is awarded. 
this sub-challenge would likely be challenging enough to warrant the health and it ties into our existing player verb, shooting. However, there would likely be issues with consistency across all bosses. The difficulty would change depending on the boss, whether the arena has multiple platforms, the boss relocates often, or if there are area denial attacks that prevent the player from standing in certain positions. It would also be an impractical challenge to implement because it would require a brand new system that calls for either new animations or several alternate renderings. It's most definitely not worth the effort for a single charm. So it's doubtful we can do much with the player verb shooting, because we'll likely run into the same problems no matter what. The player verb shooting also excels in its simplicity, so let's leave it alone. Another player verb we might consider is parrying. Parrying is what Heartring currently uses, but ineffectively. The simplest option would be to use the same method Heartring does currently. You must parry a number of times before receiving health, but require a higher number of parries for each health gained, up to a maximum of two health. The 6 parry requirement could stay the same, but require 3 parries per health. These 6 and 3 numbers are just rough estimations based on current charms and would be fine-tuned through playtesting. It's not super exciting, but it emphasizes the one aspect of Cuphead, other than time efficiency and health retention, that players have control over and can improve. The problem is that it's boring and doesn't really fix the issue that players are already parrying for the ranking system. A more complex and exciting parrying requirement might be if the player has to parry one specific parryable object of a different color, such as gold, and there's only two of them total during a fight, one per possible health gained. So, if the player has heart rain equipped, they'll have the standard pink objects that only provide super meter in addition to new, more difficult to parry gold objects that provide health. In fact, there's sort of a precedent for more demanding parryable objects in the run and gun levels. Some coins can only be acquired with precise parrying, and if you fail to time it correctly, then you can't grab the coin unless you restart the level. A slight variation of the more difficult and rare gold parryable objects could require players to parry any given gold object multiple times, perhaps even without touching the ground. Upon completing a certain number of successful parries, the parryable object disappears with a satisfying sound and visual effect, then the player gains the extra one health. It might be impossible on some bosses without introducing a new parryable object, but it's an idea worth experimenting with. For the shoot 'em up plane levels, the gold parryable objects can act similarly. Players must parry the gold object repeatedly while flying within a short parry distance and following it around without getting hit by it. This gameplay loop essentially models flying too close to the sun and getting away with it. A real butt clincher moment. It would be a satisfying mechanic because it means the player has mastered the plane maneuvering, significantly more so than simply parrying one, three, or six times. Note how these challenges are not guaranteed. It's entirely possible to fail, and that's a crucial element of a good challenge. They also add something new to the game, a new layer of mastery. The player mastered parrying, now they can put that skill to the test with heart ring. It's not just a gimme, it doesn't lower the skill floor. Remember, in order for heart ring to be viable with these changes, twin heart cannot be the easier and therefore obvious choice. Therefore, we may have to increase or even change Twin Heart's downside, but again, this decision requires playtesting. The second topic of discussion is the ranking system, specifically the method used to determine the score a player gets for finishing a fight with more remaining health, labeled in the post-fight scorecard as the HP bonus. When Cuphead first released, the ranking system calculated HP bonus differently than it does today. The HP bonus previously only reflected the number of times a player took damage. It completely ignored any additional health the player started with or gained from the charms Heart or Twin Heart, or once the DLC released, Heart Rain and Astro Cookie. No matter if the player began with 3, 4, or 5 health or healed for 20, if the player took 1 damage, their HP bonus would be 2 out of 3. Cuphead's HP bonus no longer works that way. Ever since patch 1.3.3, the post-fight HP bonus is determined by the number of health the player ends the fight with. If the player loses 2 health and has only 1 remaining, the player ends the fight with an HP bonus of 1 out of 3, as expected. But, if after taking damage the player instead heals back up to 3 health and then finishes the fight, the player ends with an HP bonus of the full 3 out of 3, allowing a player to take damage and still achieve the highest rank. 
By this scorn method, health-centric equipment becomes extremely potent. With the HP bonus change, Heart Rain, Astral Cookie, and Shield Pal significantly reduce the effort required to achieve high ranks. In fact, with these items equipped, players often achieve the max rank just by completing the boss normally, no extra effort required. Mastery, one of only two objectives in the game, becomes a casualty of just beating the boss. The upgrade mentality seeps in, and equipment options are reduced to a meta, or most optimal and effective strategy. Together, the DLC equipment and the HP bonus change conflate beating and mastering a boss, thereby not only removing the objective of mastery from the game, but reducing the required practice and improvement and their inherent satisfaction of overcoming challenges, Cuphead's primary design goal. It seems like Studio MDHR realized after they released the DLC that the health items, Astro Cookie, Heart Rain, Heart, and Twin Heart, did not contribute to the ranking system so they were useless for ranking. They most likely felt that, with the introduction of Astral Cookie, a charm that takes the appearance of a character with 4 health, it felt wrong for what's essentially a new character to lose 1 health and have 3 left but receive an HP bonus of 2 out of 3 instead of 3 out of 3. This was most likely Studio MDHR's intent and thought process, but only as an afterthought, because Patch 1.3.3, containing the HP bonus change, was released a month after the DLC and was, ironically, an inappropriate bandage for what ultimately amounted to poorly thought out UI. So how do we stop the new DLC equipment from compromising mastery and the ranking system? The easiest solution is to revert the HP bonus change from patch 1.3.3 back to its original form, total number of hits taken. If a player takes damage, they can no longer achieve the highest rank, no matter how much health they heal or start a boss with. And while we're at it, let's clean up what has always been misleading and unclear UI. Instead of a vague HP bonus, the results screen line item would say something along the lines of hits taken. So, for example, if you take 2 damage, you'll see the displayed value as 2 out of the acceptable 0. Or, an even simpler, therefore better, solution, if you take any damage, you'll see an X next to no hits taken, and if you don't take any damage, you'll see a check mark next to no hits taken. Reverting the HP bonus means that achieving the max rank requires a hitless boss completion, no damage taken. There are some people who might take issue with this, saying the game is already difficult enough or that mastering a boss is too hard as it is. Well, first of all, the game is supposed to be challenging. That's the point of it, and the truth of it is that changing the way HP bonus works will in no way affect the more casual players. The casual players do not care about achieving mastery. They're probably fine with their B ranks, and that's okay because they've completed their own personal goal of beating the boss. Reverting the HP bonus change has no effect on any element of gameplay other than mastery. And if someone's critique was that the new health-centric DLC equipment isn't useful anymore in ranking, well, that's true, but it's for the overall health and betterment of the game. The DLC equipment is currently harmful to the ranking and mastery system, and it's not a valid argument for players to desire overpowered equipment to satiate their lack of patience and commitment, a desire that only exists in the first place because of the initial poor design of the equipment. The DLC actually already incorporates overpowered equipment well through Divine Relic. That said, often some amount of leniency, no matter how little, is welcome. A player cannot, and depending on the game, should not be expected to play absolutely perfectly, with the caveat that the player's score or result is congruent with their perceived performance. In other words, speaking generally here, the outcome of a battle, level, or match should reflect a player's expectations and vice versa. A player who receives top marks for what they perceived as an abysmal performance will be dissatisfied with the result in the same way that a player who performed well would be dissatisfied with a low score. For Cuphead, because its bosses are intentionally short bursts of challenge, even one extra health becomes a significant perceived change. In a game where you typically only have 3 health, losing 1 health, a loss of 33% of the total, is not perceived by the player as a perfect performance. If players even take 1 damage in a 2 minute or less boss, more likely than not, receiving a perfect score will seem strange. The top S rank represents 100% mastery and completion, and its result should match that expectation. 
If, on the other hand, each boss in Cuphead took longer to complete, say, five minutes or even longer, leniency would be expected. In that case, players may not be expected to replay bosses. Beating the boss and mastering the boss would be one and the same, so there'd be no need for a ranking system. Losing health and still receiving a perfect score would hold consistent with player expectations. Alternatively, if Cuphead's bosses took longer to complete and increased the player's health to 4 or 5, it could still offer mastery in a ranking system distinct from just beating a boss, but the max rank may show leniency by allowing the player to take one or two hits. Because each boss would take so long to complete, establishing a damageless performance as an expectation would be unreasonable and frustrating. However, either way, that's not Cuphead. Cuphead's bosses are short enough where a perfect score should represent a damageless performance. By emphasizing a damageless performance, many of the problems created by health charms disappear. If taking even one hit disqualifies the player from the max rank, then the health-related charms no longer diminish mastery. That means Heart, Twin Heart, Heart Rain, and the health aspect of Astro Cookie would be geared toward beating a boss, whereas players would rely on other non-health charms for mastering a boss. The inability to master or achieve max ranks creates an incentive to outgrow health charms, but they're still in the game to make it easier for players who are only beating the boss. Health-centric charms can be useful, but now they're situational. Situational means options, and options mean player agency. The health charms would also allow players to fully play through a boss on expert mode to get a feel for it before they practice and S-rank a boss with mastery equipment. This gameplay loop also adheres to the game's vision of improving player skill as opposed to character power. But what if reverting the HP bonus change doesn't appeal to you? Well, the alternative to reverting the HP bonus change is to simply remove the overpowered DLC equipment. As long as the overpowered health items remain in the game, there are no perfect solutions. Removing the overpowered health charms is by far the simplest option and just as effective and viable as other more complicated options. The problem, that's boring. So may I present to you the secret third option? We're all about options over here at Design Frame. The third option is to completely reimagine existing health charms so that they work within the current HP bonus method. That means no change to the HP bonus, we keep it as is. The suggestion to revert the HP bonus bank to how it worked before patch 1.3.3 hinges on the assumption that health-centric equipment is overpowered. Health-centric equipment as is trivializes mastery. Without a complete rework of health equipment, reverting HP bonus is the only way to keep the items and still maintain a fair yet challenging ranking system. There is no question that the health equipment needs to be tuned down, but there is a question to what degree and how. And that's where our third option comes in. Depending on how we redesign equipment, the current HP bonus method, whereby score is determined by how many health a player ends the fight with, could actually be a great change. This is where it gets complicated, however, because there are several moving pieces. You can think of these moving pieces like meters, which are all connected to each other, and when we move one meter, it moves all the others. Our first meter is just a lever or a toggle switch. Should HP bonus be based on number of hits taken or remaining health? This is the big one, and as you'll see, it affects all the others. Our second meter is how difficult or demanding is it to acquire additional health? This one is interesting because the more difficult or demanding it is to acquire health, the more acquiring health becomes a challenge in its own right, in addition to the challenge of the boss. As we'll discuss, difficulty refers to how hard it is for the player to accomplish some task, and demand refers to what the item takes in exchange for health. In other words, the trade-off. For example, heart's damage reduction. Our third meter is usefulness to casual players slash beating the boss. And our fourth meter is usefulness to advanced players slash mastering the boss. These last two usefulness meters are output only. We can't actually manipulate them directly, but they'll show us if we've got a valid configuration. Another way of interpreting usefulness is value. The more useful an item is, the more valuable. Ideally, an item will be useful, but not overpowered, for both casual and advanced players. What we don't want is for the item to have no use for either group. If the item is useless for both casual and advanced players, it is not a valid option. Let's start by looking at the existing heart ring. We're going to use heart ring as our example here since we've already talked about possible solutions for it, but the concepts are applicable to all health charms, including heart and twin heart. 
Okay, this is heart rate in its current configuration. Switch one in the remaining health position, meter two in the extreme none position, meaning there is currently no trade-off or challenge beyond what is already expected of the player and meters three and four in the overpowered positions, meaning the item is useful to both casual players seeking only to beat the boss, as well as advanced players pursuing mastery. And because Heart Rain essentially offers free health to all player types for no cost, it registers highly in both. As we've discussed, the only way we can keep this item in the game is to lower that usefulness down to a balanced position. So what if we take the most direct approach? Remember how I said we cannot directly affect usefulness? I lied, we can, but I'm going to show you why we shouldn't. What makes a thing useful? In Heart Rain's case, a bunch of health. But what if, instead of trying this complicated process of pushing meters and pulling levers, we just reduce the amount of health it provides from 3 to, say, 1? Now it's useful for both casual and advanced players because it increases survivability and also makes it easier to achieve high ranks without trivializing the process. Hey, we fixed it! Mission accomplished! But wait! Remember how Heart Rain has that pesky sub-challenge problem? In order to gain that extra health, the sub-challenge demands that the player does something they're already doing. Reducing the usefulness directly by decreasing the amount of health Heart Rain provides doesn't actually fix that problem. This solution might balance the charm, but it doesn't make it interesting, and it doesn't change the fact that, with this solution, Heart Rain just becomes a better heart. However, while reducing usefulness directly isn't a solution in and of itself, it is a tool, and we'll need it later, so don't forget about it. Let's start pulling levers then, reset everything back to the original, heart rain as is. To make this a bit scientific, we'll keep everything the same and only manipulate one element at a time. We'll first flip the HP bonus switch from remaining health to number of hits. This means that ranking score will be determined by the number of hits a player is hit in a match, meaning if a player takes even one single damage, they are not eligible for the highest rank. This is where we ended with our first solution in the previous section. Watch what this does for advanced player usefulness. Why did it nearly bottom out? Because when we switch HP bonus to number of hits, all health charms, not just heart rain, offer no benefit when trying for S rank. That doesn't mean that they're useless for mastery, otherwise the usefulness to advanced players meter would register completely useless. It simply means that an advanced player will not have this charm equipped while trying for S rank. An advanced player may use a health charm to learn a boss's attacks and phases in expert mode, but health charms offer no benefit in the actual S rank fight because, as we've discussed, it doesn't matter how many extra health an advanced player gains if taken even one damage prevents the max rank. What does this mean then for our design problems? Our primary problem with existing health items, other than the fact that they subvert the whole point of the game, is that they trivialize mastery. If we look at the result of this change, we can see that switching HP bonus to number of hits fixes that problem. The player must still achieve a damageless performance. Should equipping a health item offer no benefit when trying for S rank? Is that a good thing? Maybe. Casual players still get a ton of use out of the item, making the game overall easier for players only seeking to beat the bosses. So much use that it's too much. And advanced players at least get some use out of it, being able to focus on learning a boss's attacks and phases and worrying less about if they're going to lose. Now, we could use our handy tool we talked about and reduce that usefulness for casual players directly, but this solution overall isn't great. It's not a bad solution, but it's not perfect. So let's ignore that tool for now. In a mastery-based game, having any equipment options that don't achieve a balanced level of usefulness for the purpose of mastery might be bad, let alone an entire category of them. This is what I was saying about perfect solutions. As long as the overpowered health items remain in the game, we're going to compromise somewhere. So we've determined that this isn't a great solution, but let's keep following this trail to see where it leads. We'll keep the meters and switch in the current positions, keep an HP bonus in the number of hits position, and we'll manipulate our other meter, difficulty slash demand. What happens when we introduce either a sub-challenge or a trade-off in order to bring the casual usefulness down to a balanced level? Since we're talking about Heart Rain, we'll use our revision from the Heart Rain Solutions section of this video, where a player must parry specific gold parryable objects, potentially multiple times each, in order to receive the extra health. As we've discussed, in order to create a sub-challenge which warrants extra health, the most valuable resource, the sub-challenge must be sufficiently challenging to demand its own layer of mastery. 
The crucial element of a challenge is that it can be failed. If completing the sub-challenge is a given, it might as well not exist. In our current configuration, Heart Rain is only useful to casual players. As you might guess, the difficulty slash demand meter has an inverse relationship with the usefulness meter. When it becomes more difficult to gain the benefit of an item, the usefulness decreases. When it becomes easier to gain the benefit, usefulness increases. Same goes for trade-offs. The more an item demands in return for its benefit, the less useful it is. Eventually, there will be a point where the cost of something is greater than the value, at which point players will decide not to use it. This is a basic principle of balance. When we combine the criterion that we need a difficult sub-challenge to warrant health gain with the inverse relationship between difficulty and usefulness, you can probably see where this is going. Difficulty increases and usefulness decreases. The more difficult the sub-challenge, the less useful. A sub-challenge difficult enough to warrant extra health severely reduces usefulness. You might be wondering why usefulness hit zero there even though difficulty didn't go all the way to the top. Surely some people would still use the item, and they might if there was not a substitute. Her and Twin Heart act as direct substitutes for a revised heart ring. They offer similar benefits, so one can be exchanged for the other. At a certain point, raising the difficulty of heart ring causes the usefulness of heart ring to fall below the usefulness of heart and twin heart, especially given how powerful heart and twin heart are currently. This is likely why Studio MDHR designed the existing heart ring as is, with the pairing requirement, to make it useful for all players. A trivial challenge, like the existing one, makes the item more useful. While an advanced player might attempt a difficult sub-challenge in exchange for having full damage potential, a casual player likely will not. A casual player only values damage potential in so much as it helps them defeat the boss before they run out of health. Since completing a difficult sub-challenge is not guaranteed, and since a player might actually lose health in the pursuit of that sub-challenge, a casual player gains little benefit from this configuration. They would prefer Heart or Twin Heart. And since advanced players already have little use for this configuration because HP bonus is set to number of hits, this is not a valid configuration. It's not useful to anyone. Reset. Back to Heart Rain as it is currently. Since we're only directly manipulating HP bonus and difficulty slash demand, we can only make four configurations, and we've now covered three of them. The only option left is to see what happens when we leave HP bonus as it is after patch 1.3.3 and we instead change the difficulty slash demand by itself. This is where we've been headed with this whole meter thing. Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> We've talked about reverting the HP bonus to number of hits and about simply removing overpowered items, but neither of those are great options. They have their benefits, but they're not perfect. Alright, this is solution number three. HP bonus stays in the remaining health position, then we introduce a sub-challenge like our gold parryable objects, which is sufficiently difficult to warrant extra health, moving difficulty slash demand to a moderately difficult position. And lastly, you can see the usefulness is still high for advanced players, but balanced for casual players. We use our tool to directly manipulate the usefulness, bring heart rain down to one, or at most two health. By directly reducing the usefulness, we bring the usefulness for advanced players down to a balanced position, but to a not very useful position for casual players. Heart Rain substitutes, Heart and Twin Heart, with their damage reduction become the preferred health charms for casual players who don't want the added difficulty of a sub-challenge, while advanced players use Heart Rain because they're willing to take on that sub-challenge risk in exchange for having no damage reduction. The majority of casual players probably won't use it, but in return for this configuration, we get a charm which is at least somewhat useful to all players, and more importantly, is useful for the purpose of mastery in a mastery-based game. We've essentially geared the charm towards the purpose of mastery because, as we've seen, the only way to create a sub-challenge which warrants extra health is to make that sub-challenge its own layer of mastery, requiring a level of skill which casual players don't have or are unwilling to develop. Is this the best solution? Again, maybe. Like with any solution, there's compromise. With this solution, we avoid trivializing mastery, which was our original goal. And not only do we avoid trivializing mastery, we've also struck a balance between useless and overpowered, allowing Heart Rain to have its niche without being too good at it. In exchange, however, Heart Rain is no longer useful to all players. But by keeping HP bonus as remaining hits, we've also opened a new window to introduce meaningful and interesting equipment sub-challenges that reward players for completion across all health items. That window, however, might be just as much a burden as it is an opportunity. 
Creating these sub-challenges requires additional development hours and balancing. But then, if you think about it, that window was already there. We did not make it. Studio MDHR made it with their patch 1.3.3 HP bonus change. They just failed to capitalize on it. The HP bonus rule change increases possible equipment options because it makes health equipment useful for mastery. They just needed to take that extra step to balance both new and existing equipment around that change. Instead, they created items that clearly provided way too many benefits without any cost, in the process trivializing mastery and missing the opportunity to provide additional player choice and interesting challenges. Presented like this, HP bonus and balancing is easy to understand. Hindsight is 2020, and when you're in the middle of the design space, things seem more complicated than they are. It's understandable that they squandered that opportunity, but it's still a shame. Next, how do we handle Crackshot? As lame as an answer as this is, the DLC doesn't need more than the two other DLC weapons, Converge and Twist Up. Both of them offer a new twist that Cuphead's other weapons didn't already have. Converge is a triple shot that narrows when you stand still and manually aim it with aim lock. It's a great addition to the game because it's situational. Converge's piercing attribute handles phases like Phantom Express's first phase with ease, but because Converge takes a couple of seconds to narrow a super wide trajectory and resets upon movement, its damage output will always be lower than most other weapons in situations where the piercing isn't useful. Therefore, Converge is a fantastic addition that serves a specific purpose and does so very well. Twist Up incorporates a strange upward arc that can be situationally useful, although it's mostly unreliable and requires more effort to utilize effectively without sufficient extra benefits, like extra damage. Twist Up is at least inoffensive and doesn't overshadow the other weapon options, but if roughly half of the weapons in the game are either not worth using or break the concept of player choice, obviously something is very wrong. Aside from Converge, did we really need more DLC weapons just for the sake of more content in a game that doesn't necessarily support it? However, let's assume that I'm patching the game. I would not remove an entire weapon from an already released product unless I had no other choice, so how can we possibly avoid that? I know this idea is a bit outlandish, but what if we focus on Crackshot's EX move called P-Turret? It's by far the most unique EX move in the game. Cuphead spits out a turret, and then when the player parries it, it flies straight into the boss. It's interesting and the most flavorful part of Crackshot. To really focus on P-Turret and draw out that flavor, I would make the following changes. First of all, the weapon itself can only damage bosses up close, remove the long range homing shot. Then make P-Turret free to use, no super meter cost, but instead with the cooldown. It cannot be parried until it has exhausted its turret ammo, and it may be destroyed if the player places it in harm's way, making it possible to lose the turret before it's parryable and then go on cooldown. Placing the turret would require extensive boss knowledge, the idea being that the weapon itself is difficult to use, risky, and low damage, but players can dish out higher than average damage by smart use of the P-Turret in conjunction with dealing risky up-close weapon damage. Just the turret by itself, or just the weapon by itself, would deal subpar damage. Both of them together would deal exceptional damage. This P-Turret-centric idea increases Crackshot's damage output, but it does so by raising the skill ceiling, providing players with a reward for the higher risk and more thoughtful playstyle. The high reward doesn't come without its high risks and demanding execution. However, in order for this idea to work, it can't allow players to place a turret, then switch weapons to an even higher damage weapon. Therefore, either the turret only shoots when the player shoots with and only with the crankshot weapon, or the turret disappears when the player swaps weapons. Additionally, for this new crankshot idea to work, its damage output must be high enough to justify spending the effort to learn and master it. Its damage output must be higher than spread, since it's riskier and more demanding and complex than spread. But because spread is already a high damage risky weapon, implementing a weapon with even higher damage might introduce imbalance. Even if players have to master the new risky complex weapon, we don't want them defeating a phase in only 10 seconds. Therefore, the P-Turret focused idea may demand a level of damage output that the game simply cannot support. This idea also requires a reworking of how the EX move system functions, but only for one weapon. Even if it was worth the extra development work, creating a one-time exception in a fundamental system within a simple gameplay loop introduces more complexity and possible confusion than what Cuphead can support. The P-Turret-centric Crackshot is built on solid principles but may not slot into the game very well, so let's ground the conversation then. 
Cuphead works best when it basks in its simplicity with weapons like Pea Shooter, Spread, and Lobber, each doing one thing well. Crackshot instead does three things well. It has a powerful short-range shot that's less powerful but more consistent than Spread, essentially a short-range Pea Shooter. Crackshot also has long-range homing that's roughly as consistent as Chaser. And finally, it takes out destructible threats for free and changes focus between destructible targets much faster than Chaser. To get away from the upgrade mentality, since Crackshot does everything well, what if we start taking elements out of Crackshot and potentially discover a new balanced weapon? We can potentially remove Crackshot's long-range homing shot, but then Spread becomes a better version of Crackshot. Even if only 3 out of 4 of Spread shots hit the boss, it deals the same damage as Crackshot's short-range shot. By removing its long range, Crackshot could be a short range alternative that's more consistent than Spread, but not only is Spread much more engaging due to the requirement of lining up all four of its streams, at that point why wouldn't you just use Pea Shooter? Pea Shooter would deal similar damage but would have the long range we just removed from Crackshot. If we increase Crackshot's short range damage to compensate, then the modified Crackshot would supersede Spread. So removing Crackshot's long range homing is out. Instead, we could try removing Crackshot's short-range damage and focus on its homing. In what is most probably a complete accident, Crackshot's homing shot could be an interesting alternative to Chaser. Chaser is a very plain homing weapon. It fires many slow-moving projectiles that destroy everything in its path, prioritize the closest destructible target, and no longer home in on targets after a brief period of time. Chaser losing its homing after a moment may sound like a downside, but it only affects Chaser if there are a ton of destructible targets to deal with since the homing rounds are constantly shifting focus. Even then, Chaser fires so many homing shots continuously that losing its homing property only minimally affects damage output. Chaser does, however, lose a significant amount of damage output from dealing with destructible targets in the first place. Crankshot's homing, on the other hand, fires fast projectiles, one at a time, that quickly deal with destructible targets and thus loses very little damage output as opposed to Chaser. The catch is that its projectiles lose homing immediately. Crankshot's homing rounds almost always connect with their target anyway, making it just a better Chaser, but the fact that they fire one at a time and immediately lose their homing capabilities opens up a potentially interesting gameplay loop. Against a boss with quick targets, Crackshot's homing tends to miss them if they're far enough away. In order to prevent its homing from missing, the player has to position closer to the target and shoot in a direction where the shot can't miss. Therefore, Crackshot's homing shot has a clear weakness. It can miss against quick, far targets and can be circumvented with proper positioning and shot placement. This creates a potentially higher risk, higher reward playstyle than Chaser. If missing quick, far away targets becomes a significant downside in the game and the player is willing to position accordingly, then the reward is quickly dealing with destructible threats as opposed to Chaser slowly dealing with them. Crankshot's homing and chaser could add an extra layer of player choice, but only in the theoretical realm where that choice matters, where chaser really struggles against some bosses and Crankshot really struggles against some other bosses. However, despite Crackshot's potential, we now have to consider what kind of weapon additions would be healthy for the game. Crackshot as a new homing weapon would introduce yet another consistent weapon option. Consistency is by far the most powerful and abusable attribute in Cuphead. Consistency is the reason why charge is the best base game weapon option. Players with charge equipped can jump around and dodge attacks without missing a single shot because while they're moving around, they're charging the shot, and only once the shot is fully charged do they actually need to turn to face in the direction of the boss. This consistency runs contrary to the well-designed baseline weapons, Pea Shooter and Spread. With Pea Shooter and Spread, and for that matter Lobber, Converge, and Twist Up, if the player is moving and dodging, then they're most likely not dealing damage to the boss. For example, Pea Shooter deals 30 DPS, or damage per second, but it's not dealing 30 DPS whenever the player is moving, dodging, or jumping around. Whereas Charge deals 35 DPS with perfect charges, and it still deals that 35 DPS even when the player is moving, dodging, or jumping around. Even if we consider that the player is most likely dealing closer to 30 DPS with charge because 35 requires perfect charges, 30 DPS on a consistent weapon blows away 30 DPS on an inconsistent weapon like Pea Shooter and Spread. Inconsistent weapons simply aren't dealing anywhere near their potential because the player cannot deal its damage consistently. Cuphead's gameplay loop revolves around repositioning around the arena in order to find openings in the boss's attacks to deal the most damage to the boss. Consistent weapons, namely Charge, Roundabout, Chaser, and Crankshot, remove a key part from the gameplay loop of finding openings in the boss's attacks in order to deal damage. 
Because consistency diminishes the gameplay loop so significantly, Cuphead must handle consistency carefully. Consistency should be the exception, not the rule. For example, Chaser offers consistency as its primary benefit. Consistency is the whole reason for the weapon to exist, but that consistency also comes with the trade-off of lower damage, coming in at only 17.1 DPS, nearly a 50% decrease from other weapon options. Even though Chaser deals that 17.1 DPS consistently, it's enough of a damage decrease to noticeably extend the length of a boss, enough to mostly prevent players from achieving the time requirement for max ranks. Therefore, Chaser becomes a great weapon for beginners, which they can grow out of as they improve. Not only do players desire to grow out of Chaser for mastery and achieving the S rank's time requirement, but also beginner and casual players for equally significant time reasons. If casual players learn how to properly utilize higher damage weapons like Pea Shooter, they'll beat bosses quicker in the long run, overall increasing their rate of success. Chaser has its place in Cuphead but only works because it smartly leverages consistency as an exception. Unfortunately, consistency has become the rule. Charge's primary benefits are its consistency and high damage, with minimal trade-offs. It doesn't deal with large groups of small enemies super well, but those situations are very rare, and its uncharged shots are quick enough and deal enough damage to mostly negate that downside anyway. Roundabout isn't as consistent as Charge and Chaser, but it's much more consistent than Pea Shooter and even deals slightly more DPS. Roundabout has a harder time reaching higher up enemies, but it's an uncommon situation that rarely impacts the weapon to a significant degree. Crankshot is about as consistent as Chaser, but deals with destructible targets quicker. Crankshot is also more versatile than Chaser since it's merged with a short range pea shooter. Each of these weapons leverage consistency without sufficient drawbacks. They're all upgrades that take away player choice instead of contributing to it. Only Chaser successfully leverages consistency as an option, but it only did so with strict and distinct downsides. For weapons to be balanced against each other, consistency must be an exception. For example, the only method by which we balance Roundabout is to reduce its consistency. If Roundabout limited its range not only in front of Cuphead but behind him as well, now Roundabout has a clear benefit of dealing damage behind the player but with a clear trade-off where the player has to stay close to the boss. Roundabout now competes with Spread as a close range weapon option but it offers its own benefits and downsides that are completely different from Spread. Both are close range weapons, but spread requires stricter positioning and aiming in return for higher damage, while roundabout would offer higher close range consistency in return for lower damage than spread. It still has some consistency, but it's controlled and limited to the more risky close range distance from the boss, and there's still a reason to use spread. So, despite Crankshot's homing only idea rooting itself entirely in consistency, a concept that should be an exception in Cuphead's design, can we make it work? Crankshot's homing shot essentially tries to fill a void that Chaser already fills. The main difference is that Crankshot's homing has the benefit of dealing with destructible targets significantly quicker, and the trade-off of possibly missing quickly moving distant targets. That difference aside, when we really dig into the core of Crankshot's homing shot, the crux of it is exactly that of Chasers, a weapon for beginner casual players so they can concentrate on improving their dodging whilst engaging with a lengthier boss. Chaser is designed to be a weapon that players move away from as they improve, especially once they pursue mastery. It's also designed to be effective as a secondary complementary weapon, useful for dispatching destructible threats, but not so much for dishing out damage. Despite Crackshot's homing differences, it's also useful at dispatching threats and also deals low damage. It fundamentally serves the same purpose as Chaser, except it's better. If we wanted to maintain the idea of situationally useful weapons, since that's such a strong basis for weapon design, we could rework Crackshot's homing shot so Chaser and Crackshot serve as completely different secondary weapons. Crackshot's homing shot would serve one purpose, while Chaser serves another. Both would still serve as casual or supplementary weapons without stepping on each other's toes. That raises the question though, what else would a secondary homing weapon be good for other than destructible targets? Frankly, I don't know the answer to that question and I don't know what the rework looks like because there are very few variables we can change. Damage, projectile speed, and projectile path that might make Crackshot's homing shot serve a different purpose. Without expanding the game beyond what it can support, Crackshot's homing shot just doesn't fit. 
How Studio MDHR mishandled consistency raises questions about their design process. And while we don't have any deep insights into their weapon design process, they at least gave us a potential, though unintentional, small window in an interview. Do you have yeah. a personal favorite weapon or power-up? I'm simple. So I'm just like, I always go pea shotter and spread. I just like having two things that don't really change the gameplay or make me have to think just enough to keep me focused. But I definitely wouldn't say that's the best combination. I'm even weirder. I think 95% of my cuphead play is pea shot only. Pea shot kind of only. Like, yeah, wow. pea shot only. And it's, it's the default weapon. It kind of just feels like that, you know, it's the first thing we really nailed and what we played around with early on. As much evidence as there is for the overpowered weapons in Cuphead, how the co-creators and lead designer of Cuphead play their game with the base pea shooter and sometimes spread speaks to how some of the other weapons did not receive the exact same love and how they were experienced and thus designed and balanced. Maybe they just didn't know how to implement balanced weapons in Cuphead. And that's certainly not a far-fetched statement because Cuphead does doesn't really support many viable weapon options in the first place. There's only so much design space to work with in a game of very limiting constraints and player verbs, as we've discussed with Heartrain. We can shoot, use supers, parry, and maneuver within a remarkably confined space against bosses that only last a minute or two. Pretty quickly, after designing the first few weapons, new weapons begin to break existing ones. The design space is limited, but also an opportunity for each addition to feel unique and satisfying in their own right. So, while challenging, weapon design brings the opportunity for player options, choice, and agency, all essential elements in a game. Unfortunately, we can see that missed opportunity here in Cuphead's base game and now the DLC. Overall, Crackshot tries to fill an empty spot between Pea Shooter, Spread, and Chaser that just doesn't exist, so not a single part of Crackshot can remain without breaking an existing weapon. We have to create a brand new weapon from scratch, which, admittedly, is incredibly difficult in a game that relies on simple weapons that are still just as effective as any other weapon, whether in playstyle or situationally. I personally just wouldn't, because it feels like adding additional content just for the sake of content without paying mind to the existing design. To illustrate how difficult it is to make a simple weapon effective, even one of Studio MDHR's prototype weapons called Ranger, despite its simple concept, didn't make it into the final game. It didn't fit into Cuphead's framework and limitations. Ranger deals more damage the further it travels, which can be an engaging upgrade for long-range character archetypes in games, but the concept only works if there's a threat of close-range vulnerability or a high risk in gaining and maintaining distance. In Cuphead, ultimately the player controls the distance between themselves and the boss, and the boss's little influence on it. So Ranger would straight up be an overpowered addition because Cuphead's design has limitations for the weapons and charms it can support. With that said, I have one idea. A weapon with below average damage and which looks similar to a standard pea shooter, but the damage briefly increases to above average whenever the player exercises the player verb maneuvering. Say, for example, by jumping onto a platform different than the one they're currently standing on. The idea behind the weapon is similar to spread, in that it takes more effort and higher risk to utilize effectively but the reward is a higher than average damage output. The player isn't up close and personal like spread, but the idea of always having to move elsewhere even when you don't want or need to can put yourself in danger, and if you don't put yourself in danger, then the lower damage output can easily cause you to lose by attrition just from the damage difference. This new concept would obviously need playtested to balance the damage output against P Shooter and Spread, and to test if the high risk playstyle is a reality rather than just a design theory. But in a game where the existing weapons already extend beyond what its design allows, I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't work in practice despite its theoretical practicality within Cuphead's framework. Now, for the icing on the cake, remove Crankshot, and while I'm at it, remove Charge and rework Roundabout as well. Again, all three are consistent high damage output weapons for very little effort that completely remove the concept of weapon options from Cuphead. Any new idea simply wouldn't be worth the effort as long as those three weapons remain in the game. Finally, how do we handle Miss Chalice? 
Time and time again, in interviews, Studio MDHR emphasizes how they intended for Miss Chalice to provide more player options and how Miss Chalice and Cuphead have complementary movesets, letting players play the game in different ways. In a DualShockers interview conducted by Sam Woods, according to Maya Maldenhauer, studio director and executive producer, I prefer playing as Miss Chalice. I think they all have complementary skill sets. It was a different way to play the game. You can also play the core game with Miss Chalice, allowing you to experience the game in a different way. Maya continues in a Game Informer interview by Alex Stadnick. But I think with Miss Chalice's new abilities, it's complementary to Cup and a Mugman. So somebody who may not have hit every parry or been able to do things with Cup Mugman, give Miss Chalice a chance. Mm -hmm. You never know. Studio MDHR expresses how Miss Chalice's different playstyle can be an alternative to how Cuphead plays. So if the player has trouble parrying with Cuphead, they can try out Miss Chalice for a different playstyle. They also make it clear that Miss Chalice isn't intended to be an easy mode, and that they still stand by their original design intent of invoking satisfaction from overcoming challenges. And I think the, the point y'all were hitting on and, and when we talked before was she's not easy mode, right? No, no it's not. still going to be difficult. But at, at its core, it's our love letter to 1980s retro arcade games, and they're not fun if they're not challenging. In an Os Gamers interview by Costa Andreatis, Jared Moldenhauer, co-founder and lead game designer of Studio MDHR, says, If the DLC is additional content, something for the fan base who enjoyed the game, the expectation would be somewhere within what you have already played. And we wanted to stick to that realm of difficulty. More importantly though, we put the focus on newer ways of playing. Something different so it doesn't feel like it reminds you of boss A plus boss B. And that was harder than deciding on the difficulty itself. We did a few things to mitigate a little bit of the difficulty by not making it easier, but just adding more player choice. Having an extra set of weapons and an extra set of charms and trying our best to balance them. There are certain advantages in fights that may have been far more difficult before and it's not as though the pattern's any easier, you have a few more options to pick and choose from. In a Cuphead DLC presentation coverage by Chris Carter from Destructoid, Jared Moldenhauer says, We wanted to find a new way to balance and have more options for players. I see Chalice as two different angles as how you might play. She's advantageous in specific situations. She can't use the other set of charms like extra health. She kind of gets this amalgamation of a few different charms. They have a little bit of a give and take depending on what you choose. However, their vision and design intent for Miss Chalice as an alternative playstyle or player option couldn't be further from reality. She's advantageous not only in specific situations, but virtually all situations. She has no give and take, not even close, and I would never have assumed that intent if it wasn't coming straight from their mouths. She doesn't offer player choice, but rather strictly lowers the difficulty by a disproportionate amount, even significantly undermining the importance and satisfaction of mastery in the ranking system. Since Miss Chalice lowers the skill floor, she's not an option that represents player choice or a reasonably optional playstyle, but rather a strictly better, more forgiving, and extraordinarily more flexible new baseline character that replaces Cuphead entirely in every way imaginable. Cuphead, as a character, can still be simple and represent a simplistic playstyle, but that doesn't mean he has to be worse than a more complex character. It just means he's more shallow with less mastery potential in comparison. In order to represent a player option, one that resembles a different playstyle to Cuphead, she simply cannot be strictly better than Cuphead. Both options must be viable in order for player choice to even exist. If Studio MDHR really desired to provide an alternative to Cuphead's tight finicky parrying, for example, and Miss Chalice's alternative solution to parrying was better than Cuphead's, then Miss Chalice must incorporate a trade-off, a downside or drawback, a con for the pros that it provides. Instead of providing an alternative playstyle, Studio MDHR created a charm, Astral Cookie, with an amalgamation of different effects. These effects are demonstrably more effective and powerful than any other charm, cited by Studio MDHR as intended to make up for the single lost charm slot. In order to play as her, you have to equip a cookie charm, but because to play as her, you have to equip the cookie charm, you no longer have that charm slot. But she does come with a dash parry, so you don't have to perfectly time your parries. She has an invincible roll, so when you have ground enemies, you have a window of time where you're invincible if you do a roll. She has a double jump, 
and she also ha comes with an extra HP. So it's a nice. bit of an amalgamation of different charms right. in one mm -hmm. since you don't get that charm slot. After all is said and done, it seems that Studio MDH are genuinely intended to balance Miss Chalice by enlisting her as an alternative playstyle option that had her own benefits differentiated from Cuphead, but they didn't know how to accomplish or execute that vision. Before looking at any solutions, we have to understand that for every upside Miss Chalice brings, there must be a relatively equal downside. This is the only way to create choice. If Miss Chalice is truly to be one of the player's options, rather than the only option in the process of planting Cuphead and every single charm in the game, then there must be a reason to use Cuphead instead of Miss Chalice. And that reason can't be familiarity. Through the game's design, we must answer the question, what can Cuphead bring to the table that Miss Chalice cannot? Currently, nothing. And that's a potentially scary and disappointing answer, because giving Miss Chalice enough downsides to balance her against Cuphead might result in a really lame addition. Therefore, I offer a cop-out. A simplest solution, which would go a long way toward fixing imbalance, but is ultimately a bandage over the gaping wound of poor equipment design. If Studio MDHR truly desires to keep Miss Chalice, and Heart Ring for that matter, as they are without changing them, then the only viable solution is to separate the DLC content from the base game. Miss Chalice must only be playable in the DLC. None of the DLC equipment may be used for the base game bosses. Base game equipment may be used in the DLC, but it would be an opt-in situation. The player would be made aware that using base game equipment in the DLC is not the intent and would represent a sort of challenge mode. Mode. By isolating the DLC content, Miss Chalice and the other DLC charms can all be whatever power level they want to be, as long as the DLC content is balanced against itself. Additionally, and crucially, they must then balance the DLC bosses around Miss Chalice. Currently, as we've discussed, Studio MDHR aimed to hit the IL-3 difficulty for the DLC bosses, so the DLC would need to be rebalanced to match the DLC equipment's much higher power level. However, Studio MDHR's vision for the DLC and Miss Chalice is to allow her to be playable in the base game. While isolating the DLC content from the base game is a viable solution and one I would take if Miss Chalice remained unchanged, we'll discuss other possible solutions that accommodate their vision. The vision of a DLC that's compatible with the base game and one that first and foremost promotes player choice. There are two general approaches to ensure compatibility with the base game, but if you stick around, I'll also introduce a final secret approach for if we were redesigning Miss Chalice from the ground up, leaving us with the best outcome as a result. We must first, however, make some universal changes to Miss Chalice that apply no matter which approach we take. The ultimate goal is for Miss Chalice and Cuphead to have the same skill floor, but different skill ceilings, so that both characters are considered player options with the same power level, but one has more depth and mastery potential. To do this, we must alter or remove anything that lowers the skill floor. Any part of Astral Cookie that lowers the skill floor, or decreases overall difficulty, cannot remain. We will keep those elements of Astral Cookie which raise the skill ceiling, specifically the additional movement options and control which contribute to that higher ceiling. The biggest and most obvious flaw, and the one most incompatible with the design vision, is the extra health. Miss Chalice's health cannot be 4, it must be the standard 3. The difference between 3 and 4 health is a simple and small change, but it makes a world of difference. Miss Chalice's other capabilities already improve the player's odds of survival, and especially when Shield Pal waltzes in, her health is effectively 6 or 7. Astro Cookie was buffed to match the Heart Charm, but comes without drawbacks, so Astro Cookie is already better than the base game charm from just that one addition. The extra health is only one aspect of the amalgamation of charm effects Studio MDHR gave Astro Cookie without paying any mind to the implications to the base game with which they claim Astro Cookie was supposed to be compatible. This amalgamation of charm effects is largely the target of our changes, which we'll discuss in the two approaches. Another aspect of Miss Chalice that needs universal attention is her double jump. As much as its flexibility contributes to her engaging maneuverability, there's no room for it as it is in the solution design space. Miss Chalice's double jump is simply too powerful. It allows the player to both correct mistakes and hit the ground faster in order to regain full ground control. Dependent on the chosen approach and how the approaches fare in playtesting, we can either remove the double jump entirely, reduce her jump height, or remove the ability to fine tune the jumps by holding down the jump button for the desired amount of time. 
The first possible approach to balance an Astro Cookie so it's compatible with the base game is to make Miss Chalice a jack of all trades but master of none. Currently, Miss Chalice not only encompasses several effects, but specializes in all of them as well. So what if we change Miss Chalice to instead encompass several weak effects and specialize in none? Miss Chalice's invulnerable dodge roll is the closest example of taking an existing charm, smoke bomb, and attempting to reduce its efficiency to be a weak effect. Unfortunately, her dodge roll is still almost just as strong. Her dodge roll is more restrictive than Smoke Bomb because it can only be initiated on the ground. However, Smoke Bomb restricts player visibility, whereas Miss Chalice's dodge roll does not. Her dodge roll otherwise maintains the same amount of invincibility, so it's not weak enough to justify choosing Smoke Bomb over Miss Chalice. If her dodge roll instead traveled a shorter distance and was quicker, so tight precision is required, now we might have a reason to equip Smoke Bomb. Smoke Bomb would be a more forgiving, more reliable, and less restrictive invincibility option, whereas the more restrictive dodge roll requires more skill and mastery, fixing the skill floor while still raising the skill ceiling. Her dash parry is also, surprise, too powerful. The fact that her dash parry removes any chance of taking damage or even missing is enough of an incentive to use Astro Cookie. Her dash shouldn't reset after a second in the air. Also, her dash and jump shouldn't reset after a successful parry. She already automatically hops into the air after a successful parry anyway, just like Cuphead. Additionally, her parry should only gain half a super meter card instead of a full card. Her dash parry is still useful, but now pea sugar and coffee are viable options. I know removing much of her double jump and dash parry maneuverability options also reduces some of her flexibility, skill ceiling, and fun, but if Studio MDHR wants to retain all of that, then, as we discussed, they can isolate the DLC content separate from the base game. They can choose one or the other, but if they want the DLC equipment to be playable in the base game, then naturally, there are limitations and consequences. That's what game design is. As a side note, Miss Chalice doesn't need to only recontextualize existing charms, and in fact she could offer something different, something to get excited about, but recontextualizing existing charms is a good place to start brainstorming. Overall, we should want to equip Astro Cookie for its weak effects because it does several things. However, the key is that Astro Cookie shouldn't obviously be better than any other charm, because Astro Cookie is an amalgamation of effects and not just one effect. If we want a specific strong effect for a fight, ideally we choose Cuphead and one of his specialized charms instead of Astro Cookie. Alternatively, Miss Chalice can offer powerful but fewer capabilities. For example, her dash parry can be her primary ability. It's extremely useful but also exciting because of how restrictive Cuphead's parry is. Miss Chalice can parry without the chance of taking damage or even missing, and she can follow up her parry with another parry and jump. In return, we tone her down in other areas or, because her dash parry is so powerful, outright remove everything else. The goal is to make her more effective in certain situations than Cuphead, but not in others. There should still be a reason to use Cuphead. Miss Chalice might be situationally better than Cuphead, but their power level should be roughly equal. With as powerful as her dash parry and associated maneuverability is, I'd remove her invulnerable dodge roll entirely. I'd also remove her double jump. Her dash parry's safety and consistency as well as the extra dash and jump potential from successful parries are more than enough to be a powerful charm and might even need to be nerfed still. I can't fine tune these ideas without playtesting them, but the important part is the different ways that we can approach balancing Astro Cookie and fixing its skill floor against the base game charms. Either solution would also be in line with Studio MDHR's vision for Miss Chalice, that, according to Jaren Moldenhauer, she'd be advantageous in specific situations, and that she has a little bit of a give and take depending on what you choose, similar to the well-balanced weapon options Pea Shooter, Spread, Chaser, and Lobber. She's currently nowhere near their vision, but it's entirely possible. I have a fourth possible solution, and it's so simple that it's a wonder it was overlooked. Dare I say, we should attempt to treat Miss Chalice like an actual character, available from the character selection screen. She has access to all the same charms and weapons as our main man Cuphead, but has a significantly different playstyle. Not only does this multiply player choices, offering significantly more ways to play than any other approach, but it's also the simplest approach as well. In differentiating Miss Chalice as a character, we give her a single fundamental change from Cuphead. Not a buff, but an element which engenders a different playstyle. For example, we emphasize her air control, 
This creates that distinction between the characters necessary for player choice. While Cuphead has more ground control, Miss Chalice specializes at maneuvering in the air. And then, because every pro needs a con, Miss Chalice becomes slower on the ground. This trade-off defines Miss Chalice and Cuphead's different playstyles, and has the added benefit of increasing Miss Chalice's skill ceiling without lowering her skill floor because the player needs to constantly be moving and jumping to get the full benefit of the increased maneuverability. As a bonus, why not bring in her plot flavor and emphasize who she is as a character? She's a spectral entity who can fly, so she should incorporate visual ghostly effects to explain why she's quick and nimble in the air but slow on the ground. We're just getting started though. The existing Astro Cookie Charm has a bunch of effects tacked onto it, and by simplifying Miss Chalice to one fundamental change, we can start to spread those existing effects around into different and new charms, providing significantly more player options in the process. With this change, both Cuphead and Miss Chalice can equip the same charms and weapons, so every new addition is multiplying player choice. While charm effects remain the same between characters, how a player uses them might not since Cuphead and Miss Chalice would have different playstyles. And the new charms created by dismantling Astro Cookie are many. If we look at each of the overpowered effects of the current Astro Cookie, we could create a double jump charm, a parry dash charm, a parrying charm that resets the player's jump and dash on a successful parry, and an invulnerable Dontrol charm that, of course, differentiates itself from Smoke Bomb in some way. If Studio MDHR really wants to maintain their amalgamation of effects idea, we can even offer new charms that combine two existing charms, but each effect is significantly less potent. Potent. So instead of locking Miss Chalice in as a charm that's only great at one thing, like parrying, as described in the previous possible approach, she can offer several different options that open up more player choice. And these options are now available to Cuphead. And of course, these would all need to be individually designed, play tested, and balanced to provide satisfying player options and choice rather than a shallow upgrade system. Not only does this character solution offer more options and choices across the board, but it's actually simpler to design than the previous two solutions. Treating Miss Chalice as an actual character reduces the complexity of balancing. Miss Chalice, as a character, only has to be balanced against Cuphead as a character. Charms don't even come into the equation until later. Each character offers their own playstyle rather than an upgrade, and now balance becomes a simple matter of comparing one single character aspect against another. Each charm also only has to be balanced against other charms, as opposed to trying to balance all the many combined effects of Astro Cookie against each of Cuphead's individual charms. A charm might be slightly better with one character than the other, but because Cuphead and Miss Chalice offer different playstyles instead of different power levels, any charms that slightly affect one more than the other would be part of satisfying discovery and experimentation. Again, balance in a very limiting game like Cuphead still isn't easy, but we can certainly simplify the process. Currently, Miss Chalice and her charm effects are all lumped together, which overcomplicates the design process. So, if we can simplify the design process while also providing the exact player options and choice that Studio MDHR desired and more, then why didn't Studio MDHR do this? Well, according to Chad Moldenhauer in a Screen Rant interview led by Devin McClure, Part of it is giving Miss Chalice the cookie and letting the player play as her temporarily for that boss battle, or whatever stage they're on, makes it so we didn't have to have Miss Chalice walking around the world map, going back to the first game and being part of the cutscenes, and the dialogue all having to change. Keeping the base game story intact makes sense, as does reducing the workload, but not at the expense of fundamental game design. However, even if she's selectable on the character selection screen, how she works in-game could remain the exact same. When you select Miss Chalice, it's Cuphead walking around, and then he eats the cookie and they switch places as normal. Miss Chalice becomes a playable character only after obtaining the cookie, when the player accesses the DLC aisle. So that's the easy story explanation for Cuphead being the only one walking in the overworld. Nothing changes. For convenience, we can also add functionality to switch characters from the overworld instead of having to go back to the character selection on the save file, potentially in the equip card. The pieces are there, they could have made it work. Even if the pieces weren't there, if Studio MDHR's vision for Miss Chalice demands a certain workload to produce well, then they have to either commit to that workload or decide it's out of the project's scope. They either do the work to incorporate Miss Chalice, or they don't include her in the DLC at all. Both are equally viable options, but one cannot be chosen over the other if it compromise or overcomplicate the game's design. 
Why would we ever instead choose to break the game by cramming every effect known to mankind into one charm? How did Studio MDHR give Miss Chalice four health without any trade-offs, instantly negating the heart charm and think that was okay on paper, and then proceed to squeeze a bunch of other abilities in, then try to act like her design was in pursuit of a little bit of a give and take, advantageous in specific situations, and not make making it easier, but just adding more player choice. Not a single part of the result, neither their execution nor even the process itself lines up with their design intent whatsoever. Lastly, Miss Chalice's super art shield power can be changed so that damage no longer charges the super meter, rather only parries do. As a result, Miss Chalice starts at 3 health and has to work hard to gain additional health, potentially capped at 1. 1 health already equates to much more damage than any balanced super can provide. However, lessening the speed at which Miss Chalice gains super meter may be the one restriction required to create a still powerful and now more rewarding super. Additionally, Shield Pound's heart sprite distracts from visually busy fights. That's both unfair and annoying if it causes the player to lose health. Even though important information should be within direct eyeline, such as Breath of the Wild or Lil Gator Game Stamina Circle, Shield Pound's sprite should instead be near the health counter in the bottom corner. It'll still be clear when Shield Pal is active or inactive because the sprite death animation draws attention to itself. But if Shield Pal's current status isn't clear, then Miss Chalice can have an aura and or a unique animation for taken damage when Shield Pal is active, as long as it doesn't visually intrude on the gameplay. Listen, let me know which DLC boss you're most looking forward to in the detailed boss analysis. For the case study on each Cuphead DLC boss, or other games like Outer Wilds, or the experimental live commentary track on Skyward Sword HD that'll receive a part 2 with enough audience support, check the description, check the channel, stay for the end screen, and stay tuned for more. If you're able, please consider supporting the channel monetarily through Patreon on a per video basis. And for how much time and effort is invested in each video, I aim to provide value for each Patreon supported release. Thank you Patrons for your support. I'm extremely grateful to each one of you. If you cannot, do not worry, your viewership and interest allows me to keep releasing high quality content. If you're interested and find value in my content, please consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell to be notified of each big release. If not, thank you for watching anyway, I appreciate you. The response that I received for my security breach video was incredible. Design Frame is run by only two people who are passionate about games and game design, and so that response left us absolutely speechless. Thank you all for your comments. I respond to comments as much as I can, and it's been a blessing. Stay tuned for more from us. If you want to influence which games I cover, hit the notification bell and keep an eye on my community posts while I'll put up polls that you can vote on every so often. I may put up polls for patrons only in the future as well. God bless.